Well, hello everybody and uh, good afternoon or good morning if you're joining us from the Americas and welcome to this ISC knowledge sharing session on the power of food science and technology and nutrition for a sustainable flat planet. Um, our dialogue started yesterday and today we continue to explore the issues around food science and how to move forward on the outcomes of the recent UN Food System Summit, which took place in September. The knowledge sharing sessions are brought to you by ISC members, the International Union of Food and Science Technology, IUFOST, and the International Union of Nutritional Sciences, IUNS. My name is Alison Meston and I'm the Director of Communications for the International Science Council. If you missed yesterday, the feedback has been extremely positive, with more than 240 participants sharing their ideas, on food, nutrition and sustainability as part of this dialogue. Before I hand you over to our co-chairs, Dr. Vish Prakash and Professor J. Alfredo Martinez, uh, let's just do some housekeeping. Um, this session is being recorded and there will be simultaneous interpretation in French and Spanish. You can hear the simultaneous interpretation by clicking on the interpretation globe at the bottom of your Zoom bar. Of course, we'll make this recording available along with its presentations in the coming days. This is a normal Zoom meeting, so your microphones will be muted during the presentations, but we welcome your comments in the chat function. If you have a question for our presenters, please write this in comments, or alternatively, you may raise your hand just like a normal Zoom meeting and our moderators will bring you in for your question and you can unmute your mic. Do, do keep your questions short. Um, I'm going to take a moment to repeat um, what I said at the beginning of yesterday's sessions. In our many talks with ISC members, one thing has become very clear, and that is that scientists and their communities want to engage in dialogues and share ideas to find solutions to some of today's global and wicked challenges. The ISC looks forward to continuing our role in convening these dialogues by advancing science as a global public good and finding actionable pathways to living within sustainable, with living within sustainable planetary boundaries. Um, we have recently released Unleashing Science, Delivering Missions for Sustainability. And this is a call um, to action to all countries and actors for the need to urgently intensify efforts and realign our priorities and resources towards longer term, more collaborative and drastically accelerated action. Um, I think you'll be interested in this because there are five key priority areas for the, for the actions that we identified. Um, and one of them is food, um, eating an adequate healthy diets without, cons without consuming nature's bounty. Uh, the other, water, replenishing nature's reservoirs to provide enough clean water for all. Health and well-being, being whole and well in body, mind and nature. Urban areas, thriving in places while stewarding the natural environment. And of course, climate and energy, shifting to clean energy while restoring a safe climate. Um, and again, I challenge you and uh, how your two scientific unions can collaborate and assist the ISC and its broad membership in building global scientific missions to address these challenges. One of the biggest challenges that we've had in the last two years, of course, has been the COVID pandemic. And it was during this time that the International Science Council um, got together with IASA um, and uh, created a uh, consultative science platform called Bouncing Forward Sustainably Pathways to a Post-COVID World. And one of the results of that was a report on resilience food systems. And so I'm delighted that Frank Sperling from IASA, who was one of the authors of that report, will be joining you later to discuss its findings and in particular how we might uh, work with the intergovernmental system and broader science systems um, to, to champion um, the science that you're all working in and again to find those solutions. So I wish you again excellent deliberations. Um, it was a pleasure hearing some of the comments from people yesterday who, who sent us emails saying that they had an excellent uh, session with you yesterday and I hope today is just as good. I'm going to hand you over now to Professor Martinez. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, for your nice introduction. I would like to be brief and just to remain that we have this afternoon or perhaps this morning 
two exciting sessions provided by IONS and IUFOS related to aspects that complement the issues and, of course, the lecture were being given yesterday, always with a personalized population and planetary perspective in order to provide a healthy status and well-being to the overall population of the globe. Uh, we have yesterday uh, control about 240 peaks of subjects, of attendance, of the students, or scientists, or just policy makers, and we have more than 400 registered. Therefore, it's a good issue that we can continue this afternoon in order to provide more insight into the power of food science, technology, and nutrition for sustainable planet health. Now is the time for uh, Dr. Prakashmis in order to introduce the speaker of the fifth session of this important workshop. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alison and Alfredo. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to welcome again the, the, the huge knowledge seekers around the world, including me, for the second day of the ISC Knowledge Partnership that we are really uh, fusing between IUFAST and IUNS under the platform of IASC. Uh, IUFAST vision is especially to unleash the power of science and therefore empowering the scientific understanding of food, inclusive of sustainability and innovations, which you heard yesterday. And today you will hear more about that, both from the point of nutrition and from the point of food safety in terms of ultimately an affordability index reaching all strata of society globally. It is very important that at this point of time, we need to really look back on the pandemic and see how we were resilient, how sustainable were some of the wonderful way it was handled. And we need to really use the power of science and the tools of science, of modern science to understand it. So therefore, with those few words, I again welcome all of you on uh, behalf of both IU Faust and IUNS and ISC. And today's session, which is session five, which happens to be the first session of today in continuation, having touched upon the areas of innovation and capacity building yesterday, IU Faust would like to touch today the sustainable food safety in food processing, a very important agenda for all of us. Uh, it is ably chaired by two well-known persons, Professor Ping Fang Rao and Dr. Hong Da Chen. As I was about to introduce, I see uh, Dr. Gordon McBean has uh, just joined with a Nobel laureate from uh, uh, Canada. So welcome, Dr. Gordon McBean. It's a great pleasure on behalf of ISC, IU Faust and IUNS to welcome you to this session. Uh, the chair, Professor Ping Fang Rao, is the past president of IU Faust and vice president of the Chinese Institute of Food Science and Technology and is an excellent scientist who understands the bioactivity of food molecules. Ping Fang Rao, welcome. Dr. Hongda Chan is co-chairing along with Ping Fang Rao and he's a very senior faculty in the USDA and has made outstanding contributions in the area of nanoscience. And he's also the member of the Scientific Council of IUFOS. So we can't ask for better with Dr. Ping Fang Rao and Dr. Hong Da Chen to run this session very effectively. Over to you, Ping Fang and Hong Da. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prakash. It's really my great pleasure to co-chair this session together with Hong Da. And in this, in this session five, we have uh, four outstanding speakers uh, from Canada, from Indonesia, Nigeria, and the UK. Uh, we will uh, chair, introduce each speakers, and the Honda is going to do a wrapping up. Please, Honda. Can you say some words, Honda? Well, thank you very much. It's my great pleasure uh, to be with the Ping Fang, the co-chair of the session, and I'm looking forward to the four excellent presentations uh, with you. Uh, Ping Fang, back to you. Okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Samuel Godfrey. 
He is a full professor at Lava University of Canada. And more importantly, he is a very active leader in the field of food regulation at national level and international level. He was the former director general of the Health Canada's Food Directorate and the former vice chair of the Codex Alimentus Commission. And please, uh, Samuel. Yeah, apologies. Uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Rao. I just had some problems unmuting myself and it's a true privilege to be part of uh, this event and to contribute uh, to today's discussion. Uh, so I'm going to be attempting to uh, contribute with the short presentation uh, and uh, making really the case for the importance of an integrated approach uh, between uh, food safety interventions and food regulatory processes to drive a food safety agenda across the food production uh, sector. Now, when we speak about food safety, we always think of a very encompassing discipline. Um, food safety is generally at the intersect of at least three of the policy agendas. Uh, the agriculture agenda, uh, the trade agenda, considering that food are amongst the most traded commodities around the world. And of course, the health agenda. We know that food is an essential part uh, for our life. And uh, you probably all remember the slogan that we have been advocating as a result of uh, World Food Safety Day. If it's not safe, it's not food. And... Um, in order to enable food safety, food safety is definitely ensured thanks to the interventions that are made across the food production system. But this cannot be achieved ably and effectively if it's not backed by the enhancement of food regulatory backstop. So that's really the hypothesis from which I'm starting this discussion. And this is actually can be very well understood when we remember that food safety is in fact a collaborative approach and it is a shared responsibility. The primary responsibility of course goes to the production sector because um, it has really that responsibility of making available the food uh, you know, products and therefore to ensure that it is safe and it is produced under sanitary conditions and that it is not misrepresented to consumers. Consumers, of course, have the role as well in uh, ensuring and maintaining uh, their safety in selecting the foods that fit their condition, but also in ensuring that they are handling and preserving foods in a manner that will not lead to potential cross-contamination and introduction of hazards. We tend to speak of regulators last because essentially they neither produce nor consume foods, but uh, for all of us who have lived through a food safety scare, whenever there is a crisis that happens, uh, particularly with large and widespread contamination incidents, the first actually time when, when, you, when you look around you, people tend to put uh, really to point to regulators uh, and actually look at the responsibility that the regulator may have in that. And this is coming from uh, a very important premise, and that is the fact that even though regulators have no power in producing or in consuming food, but they do have a delegated authority from consumers, mostly through food safety legislation that gives them the empowerment to act on behalf of consumers to protect them. And there is therefore an expectation that regulatory instruments will be used in order to ensure food safety or at least to contribute to uh, food safety. Now, we do have guidance that is stemming from the Codex Alimentarius Commission and particularly through uh, this foundational text known as CXG 82 2013, which essentially helps define the role of regulators and the way they oversee food control systems. And food control programs, which is essentially the expression of food regulatory programs, are defined in this text as the collective actions and activities in place to manage specific food safety hazards, to assure quality 
and safety of food and fair practices in the food trade. Now, if we take this text and uh, we look at the 13 principles that have been advocated uh, through this text to achieve effectiveness of food control systems and try to define the, the mission of a competent authority acting effectively, an effective food safety competent authority is one that anchors its actions and operations in a robust legislative and regulatory framework that enables it to develop, establish, implement, maintain, and enforce a national food control system. It's also one that bases its food safety decision on the application of the risk analysis principles, and therefore this is where the scientific assessment comes into play. It's one that ensures effective food regulatory operations, making sure that the various food regulatory functions are fulfilled from standard setting, compliance verification and enforcement, and one that has uh, a scientific capacity to fulfill its mandate, mainly uh, food laboratory operations, either within its midst or through contracting operations, but also a scientific capacity that will enable it to conduct scientific assessments and particularly risk assessments. Now, the integration of the work between regulators and the uh, and uh, uh, the food production sector can be illustrated, in fact, by this uh, uh, schematic. I mean, we know that uh, food producers have to um, apply a number of food safety interventions across the supply chain from farm to up to the retail uh, through the identification of the hazards and the development of the preventive controls that will um, essentially manage or mitigate those particular hazards. Now, in order to have a higher effectiveness of those interventions, these interventions need to be backed by the regulatory uh, interventions, by the regulatory um, uh, you know, um, uh, scope of the regulators, mainly trying to use essentially the methods that were developed by industry and in fact to use them in the development of the potential standards and guidelines that will guide the regulators to mitigate those potential risks. So having essentially a mechanism where those two levels interact between them uh, will enable a higher effectiveness. Um, it would not be effective if a regulator comes up with requirements of interventions that are not achievable by the food production sector. At the same time, uh, it's not also effective to have different levels of interventions um, possible or applied by the food production sector without having a level playing field that is assigned by the regulatory intervention. And this is another schematic actually that uh, showcases this integrated approach whereby um, as part of a value chain development, there is a need for the development of a number of food safety interventions by the food business operators. Generally, that can lead even to the development of uh, food safety and quality schemes, uh, which could even lead to potential certification. And these, in fact, could be the basis for uh, food safety interventions by the competent authorities, again, with the intent to level the playing field, to create minimum, at least minimum uh, requirements, and to ensure that there is therefore an expectation in the context of compliance verification, and that supports also their operation in the context of incident investigation and management. Now, this integration of approaches and collaboration between both regulators and uh, food business operators is even more important in the context that we're living right now, particularly with the levers of change that we're seeing uh, impacting food safety. We're seeing a lot of innovations uh, that is being made available at a high velocity, particularly in the context of those disruptive technologies uh, with uh, you know, uh, the attempt to, to inhibit microbial growth. We're seeing also a lot of innovation in the development of packaging applications, particularly with an attempt to meet sustainability goals, uh, to uh, uh, limit the use of plastics, uh, to reduce green, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but also to address the increasing need to feed the planet with the development of novel sources of protein and novel foods. All these require interventions on the part of regulators, uh, particularly to assess 
their safety to assess the, their effectiveness, particularly for di disruptive technologies, and therefore there is a need for availability of resources to address these uh, food regulatory issues. Now, here again, this collaboration can be expressed with the uh, application of what we call co-regulatory mechanisms. Uh, I have borrowed this slide from uh, a publication uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Martinez and, and colleagues, where essentially this concept of co-regulation is seen as a potential solution uh, for the increased uh, workload that is expected from regulators, essentially by making sure that um, for innovative processes, particularly food safety interventions, a lot of the burden is alleviated by the work of industry making the demonstration of the safety and effectiveness. And then essentially those uh, demonstrations using, of course, guidance from regulators can be further validated by competent authorities and therefore lead to their acknowledgement as acceptable uh, to be applied in the food production sector. Another illustration where this collaboration would be needed in uh, the highly evolving process of the use of food packaging applications. Um, again, this is an area that is moving very fast and we're seeing the development of new materials, uh, uh, new formulations, and there are challenges related to uh, the assessment of these food packaging chemicals, particularly as they relate to a low estimated exposure uh, and also the limitations in toxicological data how to define low exposure from these chemicals, and how do we address the lack of toxicological information potentially through uh, you know, the functional relationship between structure and activity. And here again, that collaboration can be used where, for example, regulators can use their monitoring capability and generate data, for example, on the migration of chemicals that might be found in food packaging formulations. This is an example of data that was generated over, um, you know, close to a decade, if you will, on uh, trying to, uh, even more than a decade, actually looking at the migration of these chemicals and the potential probable daily intake from this which needs to be coupled then by uh, data that is provided by industry, particularly in relation with the safety assessment and potential uh, you know, toxicological assessments of these products. So it's through this collaboration that uh, we can have a better effectiveness of food regulatory systems. Now, uh, briefly, I would say that this, the, this is the concept that we're trying to promote uh, through some of the actions that the Global Food Regulatory Science Society and ARM of IOFOST uh, working particularly on promoting food regulatory science in the one region of the world that is the Arab region, building competencies, data and tools. And we're hoping, in fact, to support availability of data to support better formulation of food regulatory measures, uh, particularly as they apply to food safety and to making available more competencies that are useful to regulatory decisions. I hope I have made the case you know, for the need of the integrated approach between uh, regulatory interventions and interventions by the food business operators as it, they relate to food safety. And again, thank you for the opportunity to contribute. Thank you. Thank you so much, thank Professor. You. God sorry, uh, in this for the sake of time, in the interest of time, <laughs> I have to. We have to move on faster. And uh, Hong, please. Next. Thank you, Pinfan, and thank you, uh, Sam, for the excellent coverage. Uh, provide the guidance to food industry and going through the regulatory framework uh, for successful food safety. Um, so uh, now it gives me uh, me uh, the greater pressure to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Rati Dewanti Harayadi. Uh, and then Dr. Harayadi is uh, a professor of uh, food safety from the Department of Food Science and Technology uh, at IPR, uh, IPB University, Indonesia. <laughs> I got that one right. Uh, she's an expert uh, in the food safety, particularly the microbial food safety, and uh, uh, both uh, in the scholarly as well as uh, contributing to the policy and in the practice in her own country as well as internationally. Her Excellency uh, was recognized by the professional society uh, like IAFP, International Association for Food Protection. Today, uh, she will share with her thoughts on the developing microbial criteria to improving food safety, lessons learned from Indonesia. 
uh, Juwanti, it's all yours. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chen, for a very generous introduction. Uh, I will share screen. Can you all see this? Yes. Okay. okay. Well, first, I would like to uh, thank the IUNS and IUU FOSS for uh, inviting me to speak at this very important uh, conference. I also would like to uh, thank my co-speakers for sharing all of their expertise on food safety. Um, I will be uh, discussing or uh, trying to uh, share with you my involvement with the regulatory body actually in Indonesia in the development of food, uh, microbiological criteria in processed foods. These are my outlines and I would like to start by citing the uh, WHO FERC studies that suggest that Southeast Asia is a major contributor for foodborne illnesses. In fact, from the 600 million uh, illnesses, a quarter of it actually occur in the Southeast Asia region. Uh, this has caused 175,000 deaths, which is uh, roughly 40% of the uh, fatality worldwide. Uh, the DAL is also pretty high and the region actually uh, accounted for more of the health, more than health of the uh, death due to typhoid fever and hepatitis. In Indonesia, uh, the foods uh, generally linked to the outbreaks are coming from household, food service industry and street foods. However, food from industry also are responsible for about 6.3% of the outbreaks. In terms of the etiological agents, uh, bacterial pathogens are uh, responsible for most of the outbreaks, uh, which is roughly 75%, and uh, five top bacteria identified as the cause of the outbreaks are pathogenic E. coli, Bacillus cereus, Staph aureus, Salmonella, and Clostridium perfringens. The microbiological uh, risk management uh, for processed food in Indonesia is actually within the scope of food safety management system by the National Agency of Drug and Food Control or, or uh, NADFC for short. So they have these five pillars of uh, system, uh, including the standardization, uh, pre-market evaluation, post-market evaluation, laboratory testings, and law enforcement. The microbiological risk management in processed food uh, or the mi microbiological contaminant in processed food is monitored through uh, pre-market evaluation, post-market evaluation, which then uh, compared to a standards uh, that is set uh, as the criteria for acceptability in terms of quality and safety. Uh, the government regulation number 86 uh, 2019 mandated this NADFC to set the limit uh, for uh, microbiological uh, criteria uh, in processed foods. This requirement is then uh, adopted by the National Standardization Agency for Commodity Standards. So in 2009, NADFC regulation uh, number 4011 set the limits for contaminant in processed foods, which were mandatory, including the microbiological limit. This is the uh, standard uh, existed or launched in 2009, and it has set a microbiological limit uh, for various food category and generally with a single value uh, as the limit. Here is an example, pasteurized milk with five parameters of test and uh, each has a single uh, limit. The standard is used as reference by food manufacturers for lot acceptance and sometimes also for monitoring. The problems occur, however, because, for example, the fact that the regulation did not uh, state any sampling plan has caused, for example, producers to test only one sample in a lot, which is probably insufficient. They may also retest a lot when a pathogen is present, thus may uh, pose risk to the consumers. It also happened that a go lot tested in the country sometimes rejected in the importing countries. We actually did some studies on the standards on the 2019 
online standards. And um, one of the aforementioned problems may have arise from the fact that the standard did not fulfill the codex guidelines on the principle for the establishment of micro criteria. For example, there's no objective stated in that uh, policy. There's no sampling plan. So there's no consideration in terms of the microbiological distribution in foods. Uh, there is no microbial, oh, well, only one limit, there is uh, only small m, and uh, it is not stated clearly in what step this standard is applied, and also uh, not all of the methods is available uh, in uh, the food category. So uh, the other thing that we also found is the fact that the limit may not reflect what can be achieved by GMP or by good uh, practices. So sometimes it is too, too stringent for a commodity and too lenient for another. And also uh, there are some uh, requirements that was irrelevant. For example, a requirement on the total plate count for uh, sterile commercial products. So in uh, 2013, the NADFC initiated an effort to revise its standards. And that, uh, the three thing in mind is trying to use the scientific approaches, use of uh, microbial contaminant, uh, contaminants data in the country, and refer to the codex guidelines for uh, micro criteria uh, establishment to improve food safety and quality. A team is then established consisting of uh, personnel from the NADFC, also from the NADFC central lab uh, personnel, as well as an expert panel, uh, inclu including myself. Uh, the team is assigned to draft a microbiological standard according to the guidelines and uh, also to communicate uh, the draft with internal, internal stakeholders within the NADFC, as well as external ex stakeholders, food industry association and other ministry through seminar, call for data, public consultation, meetings and emails. Uh, the purpose is to be able to have a uh, microbiological uh, criterion drafts that meet the definition of the codex. So it has to be uh, developed based on the scientific data. And it has uh, eight components or at least seven out of the eight components because the statistical performance is uh, a lot of time is not uh, stated explicitly in the micro criteria. So here it was the uh, steps that was uh, uh, pursued by the team. The first to determine the objectives, and then we determine the food. However, there was a, a big push on this. Uh, we end up working with the 14 food categories, which is a lot, and then uh, determine the point of testings for both industry, for example, uh, at the product release and also for inspectors from the NADFC to uh, inspect the food uh, produced by manufacturer. The microorganism for uh, the criteria is uh, developed from the data of the outbreaks and also from the industry. So uh, with an expectation, only relevant uh, utility or indicator or pathogen are used. The sampling pen was developed based on the ICMSF uh, cases and also pathogen ranking and also references from other countries. Lastly, the data from industry, review of the inspection data, food registration data, and use of ICMSF spreadsheet, uh, spreadsheet is used for or was used for determining the limit, the small m and uh, big m. So there were constraints uh, during the development of this micro criteria. For example, the national data on, on outbreak was limited. So uh, the team also used uh, the international outbreak data. For determination of uh, small m and Big M, the data from the registration were less useful because uh, usually they submitted only uh, data for products that comply uh, the previous or existing standards. However, data from inspections and surveillance as well as from industry, which are uh, called for uh, voluntarily, were available, although it became limited because uh, the pursuance of these 14 category, food categories. Uh, the use of ISMSF table to establish N and C or uh, sampling plan is a bit challenged uh, because uh, it was a 
even the changes from no n to uh, n of five, for example, it's already a challenge for uh, industry and also for the inspector. Okay, so at that time, it was decided to have a step-by-step -step, uh, improvement or increase in stringency uh, for uh, especially for uh, pathogens. Uh, so for some cases, low performance is also acknowledged. So finally, in August of 2016, uh, a New microbiological criteria for processed foods has been issued uh, as a NADFC 16 2016. It covered 14 food categories, excluding sterile commercial foods, which is now uh, do not no longer require a uh, total plate count, for example, and included uh, seven out of the eight compon components of the uh, codex uh, micro criteria. Here, our examples are uh, now uh, the revised uh, or the new micro criteria has uh, fulfilled most of the requirement that is um, generally applied for micro criteria with the name of the food, the uh, parameter to be tested, the sampling plan, and a small m and big M or small M only for two class sampling plan. And at that time, because uh, ISO method was accepted uh, by uh, Indonesian National Standard Agency, so the first uh, choice would be the ISO, but then also any uh, method uh, that can be validated against it were also acceptable. And here is the um, standard or the micro criteria for uh, powder infant formula. Uh, there is a, a challenge to accept the 60 uh, samples recommended by CODEX. So uh, the team end up uh, and the stakeholders end up taking 30 for uh, Salmonella uh, criteria. Okay, once the um, regulation is launched, uh, there is another challenge, especially uh, as I mentioned before, possibly due to the uh, very ambitious 14 uh, food category, there are some food category that are, have not been uh, intensively involved. And uh, this, for example, uh, there are uh, several criteria, especially pertaining non-pathogens, such as uh, standard plate count and yeast mold for certain products. Coffee, cocoa, herbs were considered too stringent. The industry cannot achieve the standards. and Actually, uh, challenges also uh, occur within the government, the inspectors, because of the confusion or um, not enough understanding of the concept of sampling plan, especially at the district laboratories. So there is uh, there was a qualitative study surveying 60 informants from both industry and government to evaluate the implementation of the NADFC 16 2016. The results suggest there was a need for revision of the NADFC to be understood better. And even uh, there's a recommendation for a separate technical guide for the implementation of the new regulation. So in July of 2019, uh, a revised new microbiological criteria for processed food, uh, NADFC 13, 2019, was issued with some revision on the addition of terms and definition and new clause on the article of uh, microbiological criteria and a revision on uh, microbiological limit for certain foods. Here is the um, regulation. It covers the same cat food category as the previous one. And these are the structures of the uh, regulation including uh, the similar attachment with a more uh, detailed explanation. And uh, one in uh, the, the one I colored in yellow has an additional clause in this article too. A separate technical guides, in fact, was published that year also. Uh, we developed this to help district inspectors for conducting sampling, compositing when it's necessary, testing, Interpreting, interpreting the results uh, and understanding of what reduced samplings or Titan samplings are. So in conclusion, uh, the development of microbiological criteria in Indonesia has been quite long with some uh, problems involved. Uh, 
we learned that involvement of all stakeholders intensively is a must. However, uh, Indonesia has integrated science using approaches um, to improve its microbiological standard for processed food. And this new standard includes all components except for the uh, performance uh, of the sampling plan uh, according to the codex guideline and actually is completed with the technical guidelines thus it is expected to be able to reflect the microbiological quality and safety uh, of the processed food in Indonesia. Of course, we all understand that microbiological criteria is only one of the tools in improving food safety in Indonesia. Advisory and or enforcement of, uh, to build food, uh, safe foods through prevention is of paramount. So uh, the basic implementation of GMP and HACCP and also a program in risk management for certain um, high risk products such as powder infant formula and sterile commercial product uh, is on the way or actually has been implemented. I would like to end my talk by sharing the picture of 200 years old botanical garden in Bogor where my university, IBB University is located. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Duante Hariadi for an excellent presentation. Uh, now I yield the session to uh, Dr. Ping Fan Rao. Hi, thank you, Honda. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce next speaker, uh, Dr. Ogugwa Charles Awa. Dr. Awa is a distinguished professor at University of Ibadan of Nigeria. He is a life, Lifetime Achievement Award recipient and the past Academy Chair of the Nigerian Institute of Food Science and Technology. And also he played a very important role in the VAFOST, uh, which is a regional cluster of IU Forst. Today he's going to bring his, his insight on traditional food processing and safety. Uh, Professor Awa, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ping Fan Rao. Um, first, uh, I would like to thank the International Science Council for bringing food science and technology and nutrition together on this platform. I'm sure that we all agree that there is the need for closer collaboration between us. Yesterday, we heard about the food of the future. Today, we shall be looking at the foods that have been with us for centuries. I'm Charles Sawa of the University of Ibadan, and I will be talking about traditional foods, their processing and safety. I also want to thank my co-presenters at today's um, presentation. Traditional food processing techniques. Traditional foods and traditional food processing techniques like fermentation and sun drying date back to ancient times and are part of the culture of the people. They constitute a vital body of indigenous knowledge handed over from generation to generation. While traditional foods have been upgraded and are produced on industrial scale in India, Japan, China, South Korea, etc., traditional foods in sub-Saharan African countries are still largely produced in the home and by the unregulated informal sector. 
with little improvement in quality and processing techniques. What are the limitations of traditional food processing techniques? They are characterized by labor intensive, time consuming manual operations with limited capacity. Invariably, the quality of the products are poor and require substantial improvement. Women are largely involved in traditional food processing in sub-Saharan Africa, subjecting them to considerable drudgery, and in some cases, exposing them to occupational hazards. IUFOR's 2010 Cape Town Declaration calls for, and I quote, adaptation and improvement of traditional foods and processes while respecting the traditional ethical, cultural, and religious aspects involved, end of quote. Reducing the drudgery of traditional food processing through the introduction of simple machines will make life a lot easier for women with attendant benefits for the well being of the family and the society at large. What are the food safety issues with traditional foods? Traditional foods are one of the leading causes of foodborne diseases due to pathogenic bacteria, viruses, parasites, mycotoxins, and chemicals. The main challenges with traditional foods have to do with engineering and technology, food safety, and marketing. Let's look at traditional fermentations. This is one of the most important traditional food processing techniques. They are used for the production of a wide array of traditional fermented foods and beverages. They convert some plant items, such as African locust bean and the woody African oil bean, that are inedible in their unfermented state to edible foods through extensive hydrolysis of the indigestible components. Traditional fermentations are useful for detoxification. For example, removing cyanide in cassava, and I will talk about this uh, shortly. They bring about improvements in food sensory qualities, especially texture and flavor. They bring about improvements in food nutritional qualities. They increase protein digestibility and they bring about vitamin synthesis. Some of the organisms involved are health promoting probiotics. They are considered natural technology. Just yesterday, we discussed the controversies surrounding ultra processed foods. And I'm sure we laid those controversies to rest. Now I want to talk about lactic acid fermentation. Lactic acid bacteria and yeast are responsible for the production of a wide variety of West African fermented foods, including major dietary staples such as gari, dawa dawa and other condiments, as well as traditional beverages. Homo fermentative lactic acid bacteria produce lactic acid as the major or sole product of glucose fermentation. Heterofermentative lactic acid bacteria produce equal molar amounts of lactic acid, ethanol and carbon dioxide from hexoses. Now let's look at the example of Gary as an example of lactic acid fermentation and detoxification. 
cassava root may contain over 300 parts per million of cyanide. By traditional gallery fermentation, this is reduced to 10 parts per million. And the major points of removing cyanide are indicated in red. The major drawback, of course, is the labor intensity. Over 400 man hours are required to process 10 tons of cassava, with roasting accounting for over 50% or half of the man hours. Now the use of um, simple machines will go a long way in improving the quality of traditional foods. And it is important that these simple machines are developed and applied in upgrading traditional foods, as this will remove quite a bit of the drudgery and will also include increase the capacity. Now taking a look at the traditional and improved roasting systems for Gary, just to stress the kind of contribution that improvements in uh, improvements in traditional food processing techniques can make. On the left, you see the woman who is roasting uh, gari by the traditional method over a wood fire. She and the other women surrounding her are exposed to smoke from the wood fire, as well as fumes from the roasting gari. On the other hand, on the right is a more comfortable woman. You can see her broad smile, roasting gari in an improved gari roaster with the heating component outside the building and with a chimney to remove the fumes from the gari. So I want to quickly move on to sun drying, another important traditional food processing technique. Sun drying is one of the earliest methods of food preservation that is still practiced in many parts of the world, including Africa. Traditional sun-dried products are popular in West Africa. Drying reduces weight and bulk, resulting in substantial savings in handling, storage, and distribution costs. Drying inhibits biochemical and physiological changes and microbial activities, eliminating the need for costly refrigeration during transportation and storage. Sun drying is simple and cheap and virtually no equipment is required. But there are numerous problems with sun drying as you can see from this slide. For one, there is exposure of the products to the elements. Secondly, you have contamination from all sorts of sources, including farm animals, and these are serious food safety issues. And third is the limited capacity. But this is still the process that is widely used for production of a wide variety of dried products in Sub-Saharan Africa. Solar drying is an improvement that eliminates the problems associated with traditional open air, shallow layer sun drying that I've just illustrated in the last slide. Solar drying is inexpensive and relatively simple to use, making it very appropriate for small farmers. While solar drying is used in many parts of the world, it has not been widely used in Africa, 
because of several constraints, including potential safety risks from improperly dried and packaged foods and poor quality control, including monitoring of water activity to prevent growth of pathogenic and spoilage organisms. This slide shows two simple solar dryers. On the left is a simple passive or indirect solar dryer. And on the right is a simple direct solar dryer. Of course, there are more sophisticated solar dryers, including hybrid fan-driven solar dryers. Now I want to focus on traditional beverages. These are beverages with localized consumption made from indigenous crops or other locally available raw materials whose methods of production are based on traditional technologies. They are cheap, which make them a major attraction for low income earners. However, the quality is poor, they are unwholesome and are often associated with foodborne illnesses such as abdominal cramps, dysentery and diarrhea. They have short shelf life because they are not refrigerated. Their methods of preparation are not standardized and are crude, slow and cumbersome. They are often packaged in discarded previously used containers such as used uh, water bottles. This is an example of a traditional beverage. This is Samia and it's popular in Northern Nigeria. It is made from tamarind. And you can see the uh, unit operations involved in the production of Samia traditionally. Of course, there are improved traditional beverages uh, produced by using mechanical extraction, uh, followed by pasteurization and uh, proper packaging. Now, the establishment of food one minute plants where traditional foods can be upgraded is critical to the commercialization of traditional uh, foods and upgrading them. And this shows a small pilot plant for the upgrading of Kilishi, a dried meat product that is very, very popular in Northern Nigeria. This also shows an improved process for the upgraded traditional West African soft cheese or warankashi. On the left is the traditional process and on the right is the improved process. I will end by sharing with you uh, this short video on extrusion processing. Extrusion processing offers great prospects for upgrading African traditional cereal and legume food products, including winning foods and snacks, such as kokoro, a maize based snack that is very popular in Southwest Nigeria. On your bottom right is traditional kokoro, and we just went through the extrusion process. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Charles. Uh, I feel just like a, you took us to a great tour to the African food. Wonderful. Thank you for your insightful introduction. Now, uh, Honda, please, for the next. Thank you, Pinfan. Now the session come to the final presentation on a very, very important the angle of a food safety, food safety culture and the essential ingredient for safe and healthy diets. This talk will be presented by Dr. Carol Wallace. Dr. Wallace is a professor of a food safety management system at the University Central Lancashire, UK. And uh, uh, she has uh, published widely in the field of food safety, uh, including several best-selling textbooks 
Uh, she is a member of, she is a fellow of International Academy of Food Science and Technology. So please join me, welcome Dr. Wallace. Okay. Thank you very much, Hongda. Um, I hope you, hopefully you can see my slides and hear me. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today and thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I'm aware that we are running quite behind time, so I'll see what I can do. Um, so I'm going to jump right in and um, talk about um, food safety culture. Um, and it's what I wanted to really cover today is what is food safety culture all about? Why does it matter? What actually is it? What are the dimensions? Um, what does good look like and how we measure it and improve it so that, that we can have um, a good standard. And I'll finish um, today uh, kind of going back to the start of this session, talking about the importance of collaboration and networking in food safety culture um, for consumer health. OK, so in terms of what food safety culture is and where it's come from, um, this is a term that um, really emerged in about 2008, 2009. So it's quite a new concept. Um, and in fact, just looking at this, this slide on the left hand side, one of my books published in 2011, what we would have said then as being a world class food safety program is the um, boxes in light blue in the center there. So we talked about um, HACCP, we talked about prerequisite programs, and we talked about safe food design. Um, all supported by essential management practices. By the time our second edition came out in, in 2018, um, we were looking much more broadly and we'd started to understand more about food safety culture. So we know now that we still include those um, same elements in the centre, but we also have to deal with things like food fraud and food defence. And then we've got this rather nebulous, cloudy thing that sits outside um, that we call food safety culture. And this is what we've been trying to understand what it is and how do we improve it. And I wanted to put this slide up because um, if people have seen presentations about food safety culture before, they might have seen one of these visual metaphors. Um, we use icebergs, we use onions, we use trees. But the key point that we're trying to get over here is that culture is not something that you can see on the surface. It's multi-layered. Um, there's a lot going on underneath. And that means it's quite difficult to measure. So it's not something you can just inspect or audit and know what the culture is like. You've really got to be able to delve beneath the surface to understand it. And what actually makes up food safety culture within an organization, it's all around the attitudes, the norms and the beliefs um, of the people and the groups working within the organization. And the important things around that is that, that they are learned and shared attitudes, norms and beliefs. And because they're learned and shared by um, the workforce, they affect the mindset and behaviours um, within that organisation. And what that means is that they contribute both to the good behaviours, so good food safety behaviours, but also they can contribute to bad food safety behaviours. And obviously we want to get to uh, a position where we're talking about positive and good food safety behaviours. And I've shared the definitions that we use around food safety culture on the slide here. So delving into food safety culture in a bit more detail, um, one of the things we needed to understand first of all was what were the dimensions of food safety culture? What, what actually is in there? What do we need to be measuring? On the left hand side, um, there's a figure taken from some of the earlier research that I was involved in where we identified five dimensions of food safety culture. So those being around values and missions that are set in an organization, around the people systems, how adaptable the business is in terms of challenges, how they make consistency of their food safety, um, how they keep that going. And also very importantly for food safety, how risk aware are they? And we're very pleased that that was then picked up by the um, by the Global Food Safety Initiative in, in their position paper. On the right hand side of um, the, the slide there, you can see the Global Food Safety Initiative dimensions, which are very much the same um, thing as, as we discovered in the research. 
So we know that there are these five areas that we need to be looking at to be able to measure food safety culture. Another thing that's important is to understand how good your culture is. Um, and so that you, you know where you're starting from and also what you've got to do to improve. Some of the other work that I was involved in, um, in, in this area is around defining what we mean by food safety culture maturity. And on the right hand side of the slide here, the, the colourful chart is a maturity model um, for food safety culture. I know you can't read uh, the detail in here, but I have given this a source there if you want to look that up later. Um, but the important thing here is to say that this is developed around a five stage maturity model so that companies can look at where they are, determine where they are in, in the, um, the model and work to improve their culture. So you're aiming to go upwards towards stage five. And how this relates to the dimensions is, is in the uh, column along the, the left-hand side there. So maturity models um, are very much the, the way forward in terms of strengthening um, food safety culture. But if we actually think about how do we go about that within the food industry, um, we need to move up that maturity scale. Um, so the way to do that is to under understand where we're starting from. And we can do that using food safety culture measurement tools. And now uh, we have lots of measurement tools available. And I'll say a little bit more about that in the next slide. So what we're trying to do is identify the position and level of maturity that the um, food business has to start off with. And that can run from being a weak negative culture. So right at the bottom of the maturity scale, and it can run up to a strong and positive food safety culture. So that's where we're talking about companies getting to level five of a maturity model. But the important thing is that measurement on its own is not enough. Um, so it's not about just knowing where you are. You've got to then apply actions, um, interventions, use tools to improve the uh, food safety culture maturity. And I just wanted to share a, an example of measurement and then taking action on the next slide. Oops. So in terms of measurement and improvement, there's really two ways of, of doing this. Um, first way is to use a periodic measurement system. Um, so that might be an annual culture survey, for example. Uh, and this is quite commonly used in the food industry where people are looking at, at um, food safety culture improvement. So you'd have an annual measurement um, through a survey and you develop annual improvement plans and then you'd be working on those until the next um, survey to see where you see if you've made improvement. Um, we're actually working on trying to investigate a, a more continuous version of this at the moment um, where we're using continuous measurement systems along with um, food safety culture nudging. So working with businesses who are the workforce are answering one question a day. On the basis of that, we're using machine learning. And from that, we're able to determine what actions people need to take on a weekly basis. So this is quite exciting. And we're um, working on this in the UK at the moment um, and uh, looking forward to um, getting results at the end of the study. But I think the, the key thing is whatever type of um, measurement system we're using, it's only as good as the taking actions. Um, and that means that they, the workforce and the management within businesses need to be communicating um, so that we can make sure that what, what we're learning, we are taking actions based on that. Briefly, I want to just position this in, in terms of what's going on internationally. Um, and, you know, this kind of gets back to why does food safety culture um, matter? Um, we're starting to see increasing mention of this in standards and in regulations um, around the world. So we have the new Codex, General Principles of Food Hygiene in 2020. It now includes um, requirements for um, food business operators to be looking at their food safety culture and providing a, 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 um, a strong and facilitative food safety culture to build um, prerequisite programs and HACCP on top. 
Um, I already mentioned the Global Food Safety Initiative and their position paper, but they also have a benchmarking system. Um, and this is a system that all um, audit certification standards can be measured against. Um, so many people will be familiar with audit standards like BRC or um, IFS or FSSC 22000, which are operating globally. Um, the important thing here is that the Global Food Safety Initiative also added food safety culture requirements to their benchmarking um, last year. And what that means is that now all certification audits under the GFSI umbrella require food businesses to show that they are working on plans to improve their food safety culture. So this is really a good way of, of getting um, businesses around the world to be really working on this. We're also seeing this coming up in um, regulatory frameworks. So the FDA with their uh, new um, blueprint on a new area of smarter food safety. Again, that came out in 2020 and uh, has a major um, area of food safety culture involved in that um, for food businesses. And in Europe this year, um, we saw the update of the um, the European Regulation 852 2004, which is the food hygiene regulations, um, and the update which came out in March this year, again embeds food safety culture actually in the regulation. So businesses being required to have, have a supportive food safety culture. So I just wanted to finish off then by coming back to that um, issue that we started with in the, in, in the first um, presentation around collaboration and networking, because I think this is really important to move the area forward on food safety culture. Um, the science has come a long way and the academics have done a lot of work, but there are more questions to, to be answered here. But I think there's, there, we'll only um, get to grips with this and only start really strengthening food safety culture globally if we can have interaction between academia, um, with governments and standards owners and with industry and also ultimately with the consumer. Uh, interesting to see in, in Charles's presentation about that a lot of the traditional food processing be done in, in the home and in, a, in that kind of environment. So I think there are many organisations that can play a role here. Um, we have uh, SALUS, which is a research network already working in this area. International Association for Food Protection, again, has a professional development group in the area. And I think the roles for IUFOS and International Union of Nutritional Scientists um, in this sort of a platform to be able to share this information and uh, really get people talking about it. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today and um, just wanted to really highlight that we've got to all work together and share best practice if we're going to be able to improve food safety culture. So thank you very much and I'll be happy to take any questions later. Thank you very much, Carol, for your excellent presentation. I cannot agree with you more that the culture is indeed a very essential ingredient to ensure full safety. Now we are finished, uh, wrap up the session five, and I want to thank all the four uh, speakers, and I want to thank uh, uh, my co-chair, Dr. Ping Fan, and I will turn this back to the uh, conference organizer. Thank you. Thank you. And it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Onga uh, and, uh, and Ping Fan, for, for your moderation and to our fantastic speakers. I suggest we go into a very um, quick and short break of a couple of minutes to just uh, catch a breath. And then we'll see you back for session six, if everybody agrees. See you back in a second. Okay. Thank very you very good. much. Thank you. Thank you.
So welcome back, everybody. I think, Alfredo, should we carry on with session six? Yes, thank you. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce again today Professor Katrin Geisler, General Secretary of INS, who also chaired yesterday the session, the initial session, and also uh, Professor Yung Suk Kim from Korea. Both are expert and also representative of INS in the board and the council. Therefore, it's my pleasure to introduce her, uh, then Yusuf Kim and Catherine, in order to develop the last session six uh, that is concerning INS issues. Thank you very much. Katrin, your micro, micro. I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, I just want to say that in this session, I'd like to remind the speakers, we have four speakers, so we have to try to limit the time of each one to 15 minutes. I shall introduce the first two speakers, and then Hyun Suk Kim will introduce the, the second two. Now, the first topic is immunonutrition for a healthier life. And this is being given by Professor Philip Calder. He is head of the School of Human Development and Health and also professor of nutritional immunology at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Southampton. He is an internationally recognized researcher on the metabolism and functionality of fatty acids and on the influence of diet and nutrients <clears throat> on the immune and inflammatory responses. He has over 700 scientific publications and is recognized as a highly cited researcher. So obviously we have somebody who is extremely experienced in the topic that he is about to tell us about. Thank you, Philip. Great, um, thank you very much. Catherine for uh, that kind introduction. Um, hopefully you can uh, see my slides okay. Um, so as Catherine indicated, um, I was asked to talk about this uh, really current topic of the role of nutrition in supporting immune health. So our immune system is the way we protect ourselves against pathogens. It's a cell and tissue system and of course, the pathogens are harmful organisms like bacteria, viruses, and so on. We know that a well-functioning immune system is key to providing good defense against pathogens because people who have uh, weak immune systems, compromised immunity, are at increased risk of infections and of infections being more severe, even fatal. Here I list the four general functional features of the immune system. Firstly, it acts as an exclusion barrier to keep pathogens out. Secondly, it has the ability to identify organisms and recognize them as pathogenic or not. Thirdly, it's able to eliminate those organisms identified as being uh, harmful. And then finally, it has a memory component. So all of the things that it's done can be remembered. And that means if a person is reinfected, the response is, is faster and more vigorous than the first time round. Now, the memory response is the basis of vaccination, which of course is very topical at the moment. So the immune system is very complex. It's very sophisticated. It can recognize, it can eliminate, it can remember. And it does that because it has many different components, particularly cellular components. In general, these are divided into innate immunity and acquired immunity. And there are all of these specific cellular components. They all have their own individual roles. So for example, some cells like cytotoxic T cells, they can kill virally infected cells. Phagocytes can engulf bacteria. B lymphocytes or B cells make antibodies. So we have specialized roles for each of these cellular uh, subtypes but they all have to work together for the immune response to be integrated and effective. But to summarize, 
there's a barrier function to keep pathogens out. And then there are these powerful cellular components of innate and acquired immunity if the pathogens get through the barrier. There are periods of the life course where our immune systems are weak, and I call these uh, times of immune vulnerability. They include early in life and later in life. So we're born with immature, weak immune systems, and our immune systems need to be uh, developed and educated over the first months to years of life. Later on in the life course, uh, our immune systems can decline. This doesn't happen to everybody, but it happens to many older people. And this age-related immune decline is given the name immunosenescence. So in short, uh, infants, uh, uh, babies and infants have weak immune systems and older people can have uh, weak immune systems. So these are periods of immune vulnerability, increased susceptibility to infection. So weak immunity gives us poor defense against these harmful organisms. As a result, we can become infected. Of course, in the last 18 to 20 months, weak immune systems have been exposed as a major public health challenge, particularly in locations around the globe where people didn't really think that much about infectious and communicable diseases. But of course, we know that infectious disease is a major source of morbidity and mortality. And this was the case even before the COVID-19 pandemic. So here are the data on major causes of uh, mortality in under five-year-olds uh, around the globe uh, in about the mid uh, 2000s. And what we see is uh, respiratory infections, diarrheal disease, other infectious diseases like malaria, measles, HIV, parasitic disease, uh, account for more than 50% of the deaths in infants and uh, in babies and infants uh, around the world. So infectious disease actually is quite a burden in uh, the very early years. And in fact, if we look at the pattern of disease across the population, we see uh, the neonatal conditions that I just mentioned, but also lower respiratory tract infections in adults, um, malaria, TB, HIV, AIDS. These are amongst the 10 biggest killers uh, in uh, low income countries. So this idea of weak immunity and the threat of infectious disease is actually of global significance with or without the COVID pandemic. Anyway, we need to think about the factors that influence people's immune response if we're going to do something about this. Now, of course, there are things that we can't do too much about, like people's genetics, their infection history, other illnesses, use of medications, but actually there are a lot of modifiable factors that impact immunity. Things like tobacco smoking, alcohol consumption, and stress, they all weaken immunity. Being physically fit actually makes our immune system stronger. But there are some nutrition related factors as well. And I'm going to talk about these uh, in uh, most of these in the rest of the talk. Body fatness impairs immunity, frailty impairs immunity, our diet influences our immune response, and our gut microbiota is believed to be one of the main determinants of our immune response. So people often struggle with this idea that nutrition somehow uh, is related to our immune system. And here I list seven ways that nutrition can act to influence immu immunity. So of course our immune system requires a lot of energy and the fuels it needs come from the diet. It's highly biosynthetic, making immunoglobulins, other proteins, whole new cells. So the building blocks for the biosynthesis of the immune system come from the diet. Many um, vitamins and minerals are important regulators of immune cell metabolism and responses. Some nutrients are substrates for uh, immune active chemicals. A good example would be arginine and nitric oxide, which kills bacteria. Some nutrients have specific anti-infection roles. So vitamin A, vitamin D, zinc, and selenium are probably good examples there. And of course, vitamin A has been called the anti-infective vitamin over the years. We need to protect ourselves against the toxic effects of our immune response. 
the oxidative and inflammatory stress. And there are lots of vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals that help us do that. And then finally, I already mentioned the importance of the microbiota. And of course, the diet is the main uh, determinant of the microbiota and good nutrition can create a diverse immune supporting microbiota. Let's look at some specific ideas now. So undernutrition weakens immunity and predisposes to infection. This has been known for decades. And I really like this uh, old data here from a very simple, but I think very informative experiment where um, children were uh, given a, 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 through their skin an antigen and the skin response was measured. So this is a measure of their immunity. And you see as the children were increasingly malnourished, their skin immune response uh, was weaker. So a clear relationship between increasing malnutrition and a weakened immune response. This is really important actually right across the globe and right across the life course. And good examples of this in more developed countries are within older people, particularly the frail older people. And this is a study looking at the effect of frailty on response to the seasonal influenza vaccination in 71 older people. So out of these 71 older people, 17 were frail, 32 were pre-frail, and 22 were non-frail. And this is the antibody response to seasonal influenza vaccination. And there are three viral components in the seasonal flu vaccine. So you can measure three types of antibodies if you like. And what you see is the antibody response is really poor in these frail people compared to the non-frail, with the pre-frail being somewhere in between. On the right, you see influenza-like illness and laboratory confirmed influenza in these same older people post-vaccination. Uh, post so in the frail people, 50% of them had influenza-like illness, even though they'd been vaccinated, and 30% of them had lab-confirmed influenza. So even though they've been vaccinated, they still got influenza, and that's because their immune response to the vaccine was very weak. Let's turn now to overnutrition and obesity. So obesity impairs the function of many different immune cell types. It weakens antibody responses. It decreases the uh, uh, response to the uh, uh, influenza, seasonal influenza vaccination. And actually during the H1N1 flu pandemic, people with obesity had uh, worse uh, responses. They had poor antiviral responses and poor recovery from disease. And for the seasonal flu vaccine, post-vaccination, individuals with obesity have twice the risk of flu compared to healthy weight people, meaning they get poorer protection from the vaccine. This has been noted, of course, with COVID-19, with about a doubling in the risk of severe disease, hospitalization, ICU need in obese compared to non-obese people. Finally, let's talk about specific nutrients without going into a lot of detail. I already alluded to the fact that the micronutrients are really important, the vitamins and minerals. This is a nice review by Gombart et al, where they simply show a number of micronutrients are involved in all different components of the immune response. So here we have different components of innate immunity, different components of acquired immunity, showing the uh, micronutrients that support those responses. So just for example, for T cell mediated immunity, vitamins A, D, C, and E, B6, B12, and folate, zinc, iron, copper, and selenium are all vital to T cell function. And these same micronutrients appear as supporting many different components of the immune response. So as I mentioned, the fat soluble vitamins, many water soluble vitamins, lots of minerals, but also essential and other amino acids and essential and other fatty acids are really important for supporting the immune system. So optimal nutrient supply gives us good nutrient status that supports our immune system to work. And that means we have better chances of defending ourselves against pathogens. If you turn this around the other way, poor nutrient intake gives us poor status 
impaired immune function means we can't defend ourselves so well against pathogens, more infections, more severe infections, infectious illness and mortality. So what I've told you is a well-functioning immune system is required for effective defense against pathogens, weak immunity predisposes to infections and weak immunity predisposes to poor vaccine responses. The immune system is weakened in obesity, in frailty, in malnutrition, and in micronutrient deficiencies. This is really well described with research going back decades now, but I think weakened immunity is an under-recognized result of these factors. Multiple nutrients, including many vitamins and minerals, have important roles in supporting the immune system and low intakes of those impair the immune response and make people more susceptible to infections. That situation can be prevented or reversed by repletion. That has been shown in both low and high income countries. I think putting all this together, it's clear that nutrition approaches should be part of the way we try to prevent infections, the way we try to optimize responses to vaccines, and the way we try to help people recover from infection. What's also clear is for many of these nutrients, the intake that's required to maximally help the immune response is actually more than many people can get from their diet. So I think diet is really, really important, but also we maybe need to consider supplements for some of these important nutrients to get to the intakes that we need. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Philip. That was a beautifully clear presentation of the situation. And thank you also for keeping to time. Our next uh, speaker is going to talk about the Mediterranean diet and cardiovascular health with a 75 year perspective. And this will be given by Professor Jacques Delarue, who is a medical doctor and has a PhD and is Professor of Nutrition. He leads the Department of Nutritional Sciences and Human Nutrition Laboratory of Brest University Hospital in France. He was formerly president and now current vice president of the French Federation of Nutrition. And he is chairman of the organizing committee of the International Congress of Nutrition of the IUNS, which will be held in Paris in 2025. So we look forward to seeing very many of you there. And we look forward now to hear, hearing about the Mediterranean diet. Thank you, Jacques. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine, for your presentation. Thank you very much to IUNS for, for the invitation. So, uh, my talk is about Mediterranean diet and cardiovascular health, uh, 75 years uh, perspective. Uh, the first point uh, is that uh, uh, the first study about the type of uh, food intake uh, in Crete was carried out in 1948 by Leland Ulbau and he compared uh, Crete with the uh, United States. And what was observed in that time was a high intake of cereals as compared to US, a low intake of uh, sugar and honey, uh, high intake of pulses and nuts, a low intake of meat, fish, and eggs, a similar intake of oil and fats without uh, precising what type of oils and fat, and a lower uh, energy intake, uh, 2,500 kilocalories versus uh, 3,000. Then, uh, in uh, 1979 uh, was published the relationship between total fat consumption in many countries and uh, mortality from coronary heart disease in people aged 35 to 64. And as you can see, there was a, a relation between fat consumption in gram per day and uh, CHD mortality. 
but in uh, countries from Mediterranean diet, including France, you can see that the, uh, there was no relation. Uh, in spite of uh, high uh, fat consumption, there was a low uh, mortality, not as low as Japan, but uh, quite lower than uh, uh, other countries. The higher mortality from coronary heart disease was in, fin in Finland. Uh, in 1961, Time magazine uh, published a photography of uh, Ansel Keys, uh, who was uh, at that time uh, a very well-known uh, scientist uh, who had uh, demonstrated a relation between high plasma cholesterol and uh, myocardial infarctus in infarction in US. He then performed the seven country studies and uh, he, he was the first to use the word of Mediterranean way. It was not Mediterranean diet, but Mediterranean way, how to eat well and stay well. And he published this book with uh, his wife, Margaret. Uh, I, I speak now about the Mediterranean adequacy index because it's useful for uh, the next of, uh, of my talk. It was published in 1960 by uh, Fidenza uh, on the basis of a type of food intake in a city in Italy, uh, Nicotera, and it described this index as the sum of total energy percentages of food groups typical of reference Mediterranean diet, bread, cereals, legumes, potatoes, vegetables, fresh fruits, nuts, fish, wine, vegetable oils, divided by the sum of total energy percentages of food groups much less typical of Mediterranean diet, milk, cheese, meat, eggs, animal fats, margarines, sweet beverage, cakes. And uh, this uh, index was used uh, in seven country studies by Ansel Keys and co-workers. Uh, that study included uh, 2,000 uh, healthy men aged 40, uh, 59 from seven countries, but uh, there was 16 cohorts. So uh, some uh, countries had uh, several cohorts. And what was shown at uh, 25 years of follow-up was an inverse relation between Mediterranean adequacy index and uh, coronary uh, heart death rate. And uh, at uh, 50 years follow-up, there was also the same inverse relation between Mediterranean adequacy index and uh, CHD uh, mortality. The highest mortality was in Finland and the lower was in Japan. And you can see here uh, Crete. And uh, if we look now at 45 years follow-up, uh, what was observed in the seven country study was that longevity was 13 years higher in Crete than in Finland. So that uh, it's a very, very important, uh, huge difference uh, in time of uh, mortality, uh, uh, age of uh, death. About ICTs, two are very well known, the Lion Diet Heart Study uh, from 1999, and more recently, the PREDIMED study in 2018. The Lion Diet uh, Heart Studies by Delors, Jarin and co-worker was a French study. The experimental group, it was a, a, a secondary prevention study with a Mediterranean type diet uh, uh, with the addition of a margarine rich uh, in uh, uh, ALA. And the control group uh, was given a low fat step one diet, uh, low in fact, in fat and especially in saturated fat. What was observed after five years follow-up was a huge difference in uh, CHD mortality. It was a 65 lower uh, mortality from CHD disease with the Mediterranean diet 
plus the migraine rich in LA. And uh, if we add cardi cardiac deaths to non-fatal myocardial infection, there was a 70 lower uh, incidence of uh, this, uh, this coronary events. The PREDIMED study compared three groups, one group with a controlled diet. It was a primary prevention with participants at high cardiovascular risk, a controlled diet uh, with advice to reduce dietary fat, a controlled diet with a high intake of uh, extra virgin olive oil, 50 grams a day, and a third group with uh, olive oil plus mixed nuts, six servings by week. And after five year follow-ups, there was a 30% decrease in uh, major uh, uh, events in the two groups, the group with olive oil and the group with olive oil plus nuts. The difference was significant only uh, for stroke, uh, 42 uh, lower difference. There was no difference for myocardial infection and no difference for cardiovascular deaths. If uh, we gather uh, what I did here in this paper in 2021, all meta-analyses about Mediterranean diet and cardiovascular health, they are all positive, all significant with about 30% protection towards CHD uh, mortality and CHD risk uh, reduction. There are other aspects of Mediterranean diet. Uh, first, there are many types of Mediterranean diet depending on Mediterranean country. There are at least 22 adherence indexes to Mediterranean diet which have been published, probably too much. It would be better to have only one. Beneficial effects of Mediterranean diet have been shown to be transferable to non-Mediterranean countries. The beneficial proof health effect of med and med date, sorry, are far beyond cardiovascular health, but it tends to be abandoned by the youngest Mediterranean populations. It should must be revitalized in Mediterranean countries. Uh, it's uh, advocated by many national dietary recommendations today, and it has a high social cultural value, and uh, it's now uh, considered as intangible heritage of UNESCO from 2013. And at last, but not at least, it's sustainable. And I will finish my talk with this pyramid published by Luis Serra in 2020 which shows the Mediterranean classical pyramid. And on the right, you can see uh, how and why it's uh, truly sustainable and it has been scientifically demonstrated. And don't forget all aspects, uh, the, the rest, siesta in Spanish, and uh, culinary aspects, etc., etc. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, that was a very in interesting presentation and very sad to hear that uh, the younger people are tending to um, move away from the Mediterranean diet, which is obviously so healthy for the rest of us. I'm now going to pass over to Hyun Suk Kim, who, who will continue chairing for the next two sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. And this is a great honor to introduce the next speaker. Next speaker is Professor Alfredo Martinez. And Professor Martinez has been full professor of physiology and nutrition at the University of Nevada for more than 20 years. And he is a very, very active researcher and has received more than 30,000 citations as the result of his scientific activity. And uh, he is a current president of the IUNS since 2017. And uh, the topic of his presentation 
is omics application to precision nutrition in fighting the obesity pandemic. So please welcome uh, Professor Martinez, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman. First of all, I would like to thank you, IONS, for the possibility to present this lecture on behalf of the Precision Nutrition Task Force. Uh, merci pour la invitation qui va appuyer les objectifs de IONS en relation avec les avances de la nutrition et aussi avec la communication. Quiero agradecer también en español la posibilidad de presentar estos datos en función de la nutrición de precisión que apoyan las tareas de comunicación y de investigación y, y avances de la nutrición en concreto en relación con la nutrición de precisión desarrollada en un grupo de trabajo de la IONS. Thank you very much. As mentioned, precision nutrition has three areas of emphasis, personalized, population, and planetary nutrition. Today, I am going to emphasize on those aspects related with personalized nutrition. And this is an endeavor that is not recent. As you can see, Hippocrates, 2,500 years ago, just said that your food is the basis of your health. But of course, Galen, the French school, Mendel and others have achieved to uh, define, to coin the idea of precision nutrition where proteomics, metabolomics, genomics, epigenomics, metagenomics are involved in terms of personalization. Today, I would like to present a rapid image of this science related with omics in terms of personalization. As you can see there, the phenotype depends on genetics, but also depends on interaction with macrobiota and the environment. Here that the individual's metabolism depends on nutrition, physical activity, the phenotype, personality, where genes and macrobiota and as well environmental influence have an impact on individual's metabolism. Therefore, genomics, transcriptomics, microbics, proteomics, metabolomics, metagenomics are science related with precision nutrition and personalized medicine. First, I would like to talk about genomics. As you all know, there is a genetic influence on the dietary choices by affecting digestion, also absorption, transport, metabolism, and excretion. There are possible interactions of diet with genetic variability to affect disease risk. An example, carrier of a beta-3 adenofector uh, SNP have different waist to hip ratio and respiratory quotient. In the last years, investigation related with genome-wide association studies reveal that early onset extreme obesity has a specific genes participating in the effect or their impact on HD cholesterol or in this lipidemia. Uh, more specifically, it has been demonstrated that carrier of a specific alleles uh, related with FTO have about one or two extra kilos at equal related conditions. In obesity, uh, more than 100 SNPs has been related with obesity metabolism and of course with adipogenesis, thermogenesis, appetite, etc. In this context, Two new science have arrived, nutrigenetics, that involve the genetic genotype influence the response related with nutrition and personalized metabolism, and also nutrigenomics that investigate and research dietary effects on gene expression. 
some examples. Nutrition has an impact on gene expression and affect the phenotype as demonstrated in the Lugenov study, where different genes related with leptin, uh, hormone sensitive lipase, UCP, PGC, and PPAR are affected by energy restricted diet and also by the content of the fat of the diet. Also, there is examples where the genotype interact with nutrition and influence gene, gene, gene function at the end, the phenotype and nutritional status. This is an example that carrier of the, the mutation in a beta 2 adenosector have a more high BMI depending on the carbohydrate intake. You see the green column, the mutation interact with the level of carbohydrate. In this area, another example, uh, just taking into account genetic predisposition score, reveal that that subject with more than seven risk allele have more percentage of body fat as compared with the same total energy intake. In this area, interaction of polyunsaturated fatty acids, fiber intake, and vegetable protein has been found concerning the percentage of body fat depending on the genetic predisposition score of risk allele. There are many examples. Therefore, the nutrigenetics impact have many, many possibilities, as you can see there, vitamin B6, carbohydrate, vitamin D, saturated fatty acid, etc. In this context, which is the future of nutritional impact of genetic information? Uh, you can see here a classical example about 15 years ago that some people, depending on the genotype, are resistant to weight loss. Also, in this example, also a classic, a traditional one, uh, the genotype has an impact on weight regain or weight recuperation. You see the yellow, the green, and the red genotypes have differences in initial body weight, in weight loss, but also in weight regain. A more concrete example coming from the European project Food for Me, uh, evidence or demonstrate that having information or carrier of the risk variant of FTO with information about the BMI, information about the waist circumference, information about physical activity, and information about glucose and cholesterol levels can display, can help to prescribe 243 different diets. Again, examples of genomic interaction are wide related with nuclear regulation, food intake, intermediate metabolism, thermogenic processes, and of course, inflammation. And just to say an example that has been published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that says age, initial body weight, SNP, energy at the baseline, and physical activity can help to decide preferences for diet one and diet two. And you can see here, uh, according to the genotype and other phenotypical information, there are differences following the same diet diet one or diet two in person one or person two. The second step I want to show you today in a quick overlook is the role of epigenomics. Epigenetics literally means in addition to change in genetic sequences, and you know that there are DNA methylation process, histone modification, microRNA, robotic packaging, and DNA packaging. Uh, a example in subject that follow eight weeks of a hypocaloric diet, we can in inform that there are changes me in methylation before and after the diet, but also we can have information about low or high responder before diet, depending on CPG's hypermethylation. But also I mentioned that epigenomics is related with microRNA. Uh, we can see here that responding and non-responding present different 
profiles concerning microRNA expression. In some cases, they are increased, and in some cases, are decreased. The third point I want to talk today in this overview about omics is related with metabolomics. Metabolomics is able, either targeted metabolomics or untargeted, to find a metabolites related with health. You can see in this uh, approach that many chromatographic and HPLC TOFE um, time of flight uh, strategies are used and can be identified for following the adherence to a diet and also to identify metabolites that are related with the intake of a diet and the impact, for example, in depression. The fourth example I want to show you today is metagenomics. The gut microbiota is a new organ that is a way for personalization. You know that microbiota is involved in metabolic function, in structural protective function, and also in immune functions. But also it's related to health and disease. You know, dysbiosis is a bacterial imbalance in the gut that involve diversity reduction, elevated ratios of specific pathogens, skewed short chain fatty acid profile, disruption of the mucosal barrier, and also alteration impairments in host response inflammatory responses. Some examples reveal that obese people and also in animals, they show different phylogenetic diversity curves for macrobiota and in another pioneer study, it was demonstrated that there is a correlation of different material groups with weight loss in children. Just to make a final comment from this uh, presentation. We need to take care of gene environmental inputs, metabolomic and macrobiota interaction, where the real challenge is to integrate this information. Therefore, we need to have a varied diet we need to perform physical activity regularly. We need to take care of genetics. We need to take care of epigenetics, epigenomics. We need to also consider relationship with dietary phenotypical and metabolic, and metabolic data and also metagenomic in order to take care of this information. Therefore, at this moment, we need to consider in precision nutrition, the diet, the phenotype, genes, microbiota, etc. This is my final slide. Rather than existing an optimal diet, there is a range of adequate diet depending on genetic, biological, and cultural variation. Therefore, we need to take care of genetic background, the family history, likes and dislike, personal, previous disease, culture, allergies and intolerance, physical activity, and of course, omics and epigenetic marks. My real final is to invite all of you to the Congress IONS ICN that now, after the pandemic, is uh, now appointed in December 22. Thank you very much, and I remain ready for uh, discuss precision nutrition, population nutrition, and population nutrition in order for the health of a sustainable planet. Thank you very much on behalf of IONS. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Martinez, for your very interesting and insightful uh, presentation. Then uh, let me introduce the last speaker of this session, uh, Dr. Victor Owino. Uh, Dr. Owino is a nutrition specialist in the International Atomic Energy Agency's Nutritional and Health-Related Environmental Studies section. And his work focuses on supporting member states to apply stable isotope techniques to design and evaluate nutrition interventions. Uh, he is a very proud alumnus of the University of Nairobi for his bachelor and University of Ghent for master 
and University College London for his PhD. And I think uh, his title of today's presentation is Understanding Food Systems, Diet Quality, and Nutritional Outcome Linkage with nu Nuclear Techniques. So please welcome Dr. Owino, and please. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind introduction. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen fine. Yeah, thank you very much. So I'm Victor Wino, based at the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. I thank Alfredo and IUNS and of course uh, ISC and IUFOS for having me today. So I'll be very quick. So at the International Atomic Energy Agency, we aim to promote atoms for peace and development. Uh, to seek to accelerate and enlarge the contribution of nuclear techniques to peace, health, and prosperity throughout the world. Uh, within the health uh, mandate, we have nutrition, where we support member states to use stable isotope techniques to combat malnutrition throughout life uh, within three thematic areas, uh, early life nutrition, prevention, and management of NCDs and diet quality and nutrition security. So today I'll be sharing some examples from early life nutrition and also diet quality. So we have two mechanisms for delivering our support. So we have uh, coordinated research projects. These are uh, field uh, expert and secretariat driven so we define a research question, we make a call for proposals, and we offer small grants to uh, experts in the countries to uh, do work uh, over four to five years. And then we also provide coordination facilities where they meet to share uh, experiences and lessons learned. Uh, but the major mechanism is through the technical cooperation program, which is uh, member state driven. They uh, submit their priorities in a two year planning uh, cycle. Uh, if those are approved, they receive technical support in form of expert advice, equipment, training, uh, and also sample analysis and data management uh, where applicable. So, uh, this just shows you the expanse of our support uh, as of 2020. So we have several coordinated research projects. Uh, we have uh, technical cooperation national projects. We have regional projects and also some interregional projects. Uh, again, uh, divided uh, by the three thematic areas that I mentioned. Uh, so why are we uh, doing this uh, when we talk about nuclear techniques and stable isotopes? So if you look at uh, this uh, graph here, it simply says that uh, uh, food systems are being influenced by several shocks. For example, if you look at climate change and you look at the middle uh, uh, section here, so uh, food product quality would be affected, uh, micronutrient and micronutrient content would be impacted. Uh, and so you would have uh, the last bar there, you would end up with several uh, malnutrition problems as listed there. Uh, so if you look at this figure here, uh, it shows what is the projected reduction in uh, critical nutrients by the year 2050. So you can see uh, 20% loss in protein, about 14% uh, loss in iron, and about 15% in zinc. And uh, that is just examples to show you that. So this is why we think we can make a contribution by looking at the food systems in a holistic way and uh, through nuclear uh, techniques, including stable isotopes, we can actually look at the food systems continuum right from uh, looking at uh, soil uh, quality, we can look at, you know, uh, improving uh, nutrient content of crops through uh, mutation breeding. But closer to uh, our topic of today, we can actually assess the impact of these uh, shocks and also interventions to address it. Uh, we look at nutrient bioavailability, we can look at 
uh, how this is impacting uh, infant and young child feeding, like for example, breast milk composition and intake. We can look at body composition in relation to obesity and all that. And we can also look at gut function uh, in relation to things like microbiota that has been mentioned already. So therefore we have a suite of uh, several stable isotope techniques uh, which can do a number of things like uh, you know uh, uh, so so uh, uh, nuclear related techniques for example through dual x-ray absorptiometry we can measure bone mineral density we can use a combination of deuterium oxide and oxygen 18 to look at total energy expenditure in relation to physical activity uh, and all that and we can use deuterium dilution to measure body fat and lean mass uh, we can also use deuterium dilution to measure uh, breast milk intake, but also categorize children as whether they are exclusively breastfed or not. On this other side, we can look at diet quality in several ways. Look at uh, zinc, uh, vitamin A, iron bioavailability. Uh, we can also look at vitamin A uh, um, body stores. And also, uh, 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 Professor Martinez has mentioned uh, the influence of microbiota and also environment on uh, gut health. So we can also look at uh, nutrient absorption through the uh, gut uh, barrier. So uh, just to give you examples, uh, so looking at early life nutrition and uh, measurement of breast milk intake. Uh, so we can use deuterium dose to the mother. You give the mother a dose of deuterium and then you look at uh, the evolution of, uh, you know, body water as deuterium is transferred from the mother to the baby, you collect saliva samples and you analyze it using uh, uh, FURIA transformed uh, infrared spectrometer. So actually we can generate a lot of information like looking at how uh, breast milk intake varies by age, uh, but also we can look at it uh, again uh, based on different modes of feeding, whether it is exclusive, predominant or not. And so we can also tell different stories. For example, this study from Kenya, where we actually demonstrated that uh, children who come from households that are food insecure have a reduced uh, uh, breast milk intake. So, so this is very, very useful for framing uh, uh, interventions to promote and protect breastfeeding in low-income countries. So uh, now to looking at the broader question of hidden hunger. So I don't have to teach you again on what are micronutrient deficiencies and what they mean, but the message here is that the problem remains and more needs to be done. But what is our contribution looking at vitamin A, uh, for example. So uh, the thing about stable isotope techniques, all of them involve uh, dosing of a participant and then followed by collection of a body fluid, whether it is blood. So for example, here you give an individual a food labeled with a vitamin A a isotope, and then you collect blood samples and then uh, at baseline before you give the food and then after a given period of time. And then the vitamin A uh, will mix with the body pool and then you can measure uh, the isotope ratios in uh, the baseline and the uh, end sample. And that enables you to make calculations on uh, vitamin A pool in the body and also the conversion of uh, pro-vitamin A to active vitamin A. So for example, uh, uh, this study in Thailand, so, so children received uh, a rice, you know, that has been improved by addition of vitamin A. And so it shows that children receiving uh, uh, extruded rice with, a vit with a vitamin A, uh, they have greater uh, vitamin A uh, body pool at the end of the intervention compared uh, to those not in the intervention group. Uh, so, and you can also tell another story how much of the vitamin A from commonly consumed green leafy vegetables, like what we are looking here at here, Moringa, but also 
uh, 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 Sukuma Wiki as uh, called in East African language here. So, so you can look at how much bioconversion is taking place uh, using vitamin A uh, stable isotopes. And so looking at uh, iron, uh, again, as an example, again, you label the food with uh, iron stable isotopes, uh, you collect baseline blood, and then you give the individual uh, the food in uh, you know, a given protocol, and then you wait for two weeks and you collect uh, another blood sample. Yeah, so then you do the analysis and you look at the uh, ratios of the ion isotopes to tell you uh, how much of the ion has been absorbed. So with this, just uh, looking at, for example, how much of ion is uh, absorbed from palmillet. So, so you can see that this study uh, in India demonstrated that through the use of these techniques, you can tell uh, that the population receiving iron biofortified palmillet were receiving uh, quantities that are adequate uh, to meet their iron requirements. So, and uh, in Botswana currently, we are helping uh, a team there to evaluate a national program uh, that provides um, uh, a soya sorghum blend that is fortified with uh, multiple micronutrients. So, so the aim is to really look at iron bioavailability in relation to the uh, highly prevalent uh, anemia uh, situation in the country. And again, in Benin, we are helping them now to use iron stable isotopes to evaluate foods that are provided uh, within a school feeding program uh, to look at how that relates to uh, uh, iron deficiency anemia prevention in the country. Yeah, so something very important is that uh, um, protein quality is very important. Uh, as we all know, uh, we don't have to be, uh, to be reminded and uh, protein deficiency influences mortality and also growth, but also uh, immune function as we've just had in the previous uh, presentations. So under here we've come up with a technique that can be used to evaluate uh, the true ileal digestion. As you know, uh, standard uh, measurements are very invasive. You have to really extract uh, some uh, digester from the system. So this actually uh, method allows you to do a non-invasive procedure uh, to measure uh, amino acid digestion. So you uh, uh, intrinsically uh, label the uh, food as it is grown in the field uh, uh, with deuterium uh, added to uh, growing water or irrigation water for that matter. Then you use uh, the food as you harvest it, which is now deuterium rich, prepare a test meal using local recipes, and then at the point of consumption, you introduce another isotope, uh, which is 13 carbon either whole protein or uh, pure amino acid. And then by calculating the ratios, you can determine how much of the amino acids are being absorbed. So you can see we have examples of how this technique has been used. So this is an Indian study uh, evaluating complementary foods, how much of the amino acids are absorbed. Uh, this is again uh, a study from Mexico. And down here we have a study from Thailand uh, this was done within an IEA supported uh, coordinated research project involving seven low and middle income countries. So, uh, so as I've demonstrated above there, uh, stable isotope techniques and related nuclear techniques are very useful, uh, but we have some limitations. For example, uh, the isotopes themselves are expensive and they require expensive and complex instrumentation and normally because of that, then the studies can only recruit small sample sizes. Therefore, uh, inferring the results to general population is quite limited. And of course, you need highly skilled laboratory personnel as much as we train them uh, within the projects. And also this limits uh, scalability and wider coverage. And of course, all these studies involving drawing of blood and body fluids 
sometimes you encounter a lot of ethical issues and also some myths uh, in the communities. But uh, this is not really to bars because there are some opportunities uh, because as I said, stable isotope techniques are accurate and sometimes they are the only methods through which you can get information uh, that you need and uh, they are non-invasive and we could contribute uh, to international databases. For example, through the protein example I've given, we are going to be working with FAO to build a database on true ileal protein digestibility. And so there is also the opportunity to assess the efficacy or effectiveness impact of various interventions like biofortification, uh, fortification, uh, and other uh, uh, interventions. And all these put together, for example, uh, these databases could also contribute uh, to building, uh, you know, uh, recommendations for requirements, but also intake in populations, especially in young children. Uh, but all this can be made possible if they are scaled up and further research uh, through expanded support through the IES technical cooperation program, but also the small coordinated research projects that I uh, mentioned. But uh, currently, we are also hoping that in future there could be the development of easy to use and relatively inexpensive handheld instruments, uh, probably basing more on breath assays, uh, something like that. And then uh, simplification of these techniques, for example, by reducing the number of times that you have to collect samples, just to mention. So, just to let you know that I've just touched on very few uh, techniques that we use. So for more information, we have the Human Health Campus uh, where you can get a lot of information and resources that are available for free download. We also have e-learning modules uh, that can be used for training uh, through this Human Health Campus. Uh, so I want to really thank you for again for giving me the opportunity to be part of this. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Owino. It was a really nice, you know, interesting topic and uh, excellent presentation. Then for the next uh, discussion part, uh, let us hand over to Alfredo and Prakash. Hello. Hello, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 appear in the program, uh, Francis uh, Thotor will help us in the discussion, but also if uh, finally he is having some problems with the computer, I, we will ask also to Yun Su King as chairman to help us with the discussion. But in any case, uh, uh, all the attendants are invited. Uh, we are just checking some of the comments that appear in the yeah. chat. But meanwhile, I would like that uh, perhaps uh, we understand that in this session, in session six, uh, different aspects related with international nutrition has been developed. The impact of immunology, the role of um, uh, atomic of um, nuclear uh, techniques and also the Mediterranean diet or the new technologies related with omics. On the other hand, uh, Professor Prakas can also remind us the, the names of the session five speakers. Yeah. Thank you, Alfredo. I think there are two uh, questions for uh, uh, comments basically for our Nobel laureate, Dr. Gordon McBean, who has joined us in this discussion, uh, which really is uh, important. And thank you, Gordon. Uh, the question is uh, for comment from you, Gordon, is sustainable food involves sustainable agriculture 
and a sustainable climate, as has been mentioned by several speakers, if I may use the word sustainable climate. With your vast experience, where do you see the role of food science and nutrition science in perpetuating sustainable health uh, in the short term and long term goals, uh, Dr. Gordon, please. Uh, you are muted, Gordon. Could you unmute? There, good. Uh, thank you. No, I'm thank muted. You. Not muted. Very. <laughs> Let me say thank you, Prakash. And, I'm very, and Alfredo, I'm very pleased to see you both and see the other speakers in this session. Uh, it's very important that we have these kind of joint conferences between the, or in this case, the International Union of Food Science and Technology and the International Union of Nutritional Science because food and nutrition science are very essential for sustainable health and that kind of thing. But the issue of climate change is one that really, let's say, intersects with both of them. The uh, food is, and the production of food, uh, the way it is done is one of the most, uh, let's say, uh, general, uh, you know, has big impacts on the climate system and vice versa. They intersect very strongly. and. I think, as I just wanted to quote the Secretary General of the United Nations, who said in August this year, after the IPCC report out that climate on climate change warming, that it is a code red for humanity. But I want to go back to what er earlier it said. Uh, this was in earlier in 2021. The Secretary General said, if I had to select one sentence to describe the state of the world, I would say that we're in a world in which global challenges are more and more integrated and the responses are more and more fragmented. And if this is not reversed, it's a recipe for disaster. I think this conference is an example of how we are addressing the issue of fragmentation, bringing together the sciences, and we can do that even more so with the climate change community so that there is a, a working together. I just note that the recent Food System Summit, the Decade for Action to Achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, where talked about five action tracks, including number five, which was building resilience to vulnerabilities. And this shocks and cis stresses. And these issues, which are due for continued functionality of healthy and sustainable food system, is quite frankly, exactly what we're trying to do in the climate change community. I just completed a major research report on building climate resilient community. And we need to bring together the issues of food and health and safety and climate and the other aspects that come into all of this to work together to have a sustainable food for sustainable agriculture in, this, in a so-called sustainable climate system. One example of this is that what's happening today is this joint conference bringing things together. Uh, within Canada, I have helped, well, I'm the chair of a board that's created a, an association of professionals in climate change. And we've said we want food people, economists, sociologists, climate, natural scientists working together on this, not losing our disciplinary excellence, but bringing together the interdisciplinary connections. And I've been working with the International Union of Food Science and Technology for what, five, six, seven years now, when I was starting when I was president of the <laughs> now past International Council for Science. Uh, and I think I've been very impressed with the way this food science community and also the nutritional science community work together. And that's very essential. And I thank you very much for your work and thank you for inviting my participation in this discussion. And I'll stop talking because I tend to go on too long, but let me say there are some opportunities and we need to follow up with them and bring together some of these additional joint conferences in a way that we can make a positive difference to the benefit of all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon, for that wonderful compliments to IU Faust and IUNS as the past president of ICSU. And we are really honored by your comments. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. The second question is to Dr. Sheikh Nadia, formerly of FAO, uh, who is a really a bridge between uh, food science and nutrition, Alfredo. Sheikh has spent a large number of years in FAO and now is in Senegal. Sheikh, my question to you is, on the sustainable traditional food, which Charles uh, described very well. And uh, do you think that it will be a, a good game changer for better nutrition, uh, not only from the point of agriculture, but from the point of local solutions to global problems 
and also participation of industry in its modernization. Sheikh Nadia, please. Uh, thank you, Prakash, for inviting me to join the discussion on this uh, very important issue trying to bring together IE Force and IUNS in solving, of course, the world's problems for sustainability. I have had the chance of working together with FAO, where, of course, both organization, both organizations have come together in the preparation of the International Conference on Food and Nutrition. So the former director of FAO invited IUNS colleagues Dr. John Lupian invited IUNS colleagues and IU forced to join hands to put up, of course, a plan of action for nutrition for the world. And I think all the recommendations of that conference are still valid, put together. And uh, coming back to, of course, the presentations, which uh, my colleague made very well from Nigeria, Dr. Professor Charles Awar. I really fully appreciate it, of course, the Ogi, and I saw, of course, the Nigerian type of foods, which were below the, below the uh, equator. You know, above also, we have also other traditional foods, which are not, of course, uh, those of the humid areas of Ogi and others. We have the couscous, as you could say, from Northern and the desert area. And we have also the milk types of things for people who need protein. We have fermented milk from the Sahel and we have the couscous also granulated millet flour, steamed cooked granulated millet flour, which is consumed in most of the Arab countries. And I think this could be of course the solution for some of these uh, countries which do not have enough resources to cater for their daily meals. And uh, as a, uh, as Charles said, this is uh, ancient things and we need improvement as it was mentioned in the IUFOS declaration and adaptation to make it a vi viable solutions for the problems we are facing today and uh, for the future of food. And I also thank uh, Prakash for having led also uh, CFTRI to receive a lot of colleagues from West African regions, Francophone mainly, to come up with solutions for products they have, which were not edible, for which they have to develop small equipment like uh, wing bean, for which Ghana took the lead to develop, of course, machines for improving also its consumption. And I think we have to look a lot to say on these traditional foods, which constitute the basis for our development. And I think uh, uh, there is a possibility. There is a possibility to go ahead with it. And I learned a lot also from the capacity building and uh, by sharing the experience of all these centers which have been put up by the UN, African Regional Center for Technology, which was also a small uh, glues for developing small technologies and improving them at a larger scale. I think this could be a good solutions also in improving the traditional foods for our future. Thank you, Prakash. Thank you, uh, wonderful Sheikh, for that uh, perspective and also the optimism that you have that uh, this can be a game changer, provided it is handled properly by food science and technology and nutritionists together. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Alfredo uh, for his talk on precision nutrition. Uh, uh, when we talk about genotype and phenotype, Alfredo, uh, ultimately the food intake uh, is uh, is kind of so complex in the in the whole life cycle. So how does one really get into precision nutrition when we are talking about a long range effect of 30, 40 years on the microbiota and also on the way people have a changed lifestyle? What is your take on that uh, aspect, Alfredo? Because you have been an expert much. in that area. Thank you. Thank you very much. As you mentioned, really precision nutrition has uh, many issues and many keys to be understood. Uh, we are talking about uh, the phenotype, we are about the genotype, but also about environmental issues. The real problem we face now is to interpret the huge amount of data are going to be available in the next years. Because remember that 
genomics, epigenomics, metagenomics, metabolomics, are providing million, billion of data. And the interpretation is the real challenge we face in order to have, in first place, personalized nutrition in the subject, in different conditions, pregnant women, elderly, children. Then we need to move this information to the population. As mentioned, the Mediterranean diet has a role in the general uh, well-being of the societies. And then to move into the uh, planetary nutrition. Uh, in some cases, I would like to make some comparison with COVID. Uh, COVID in nutrition has many similarities. Uh, first, the, the infected people need to be treated with specific drugs, corticoids, etc. That happens with nutrition. If you are obese or you are undernourished, you need to be treated individually. Then we need to, to have a specific healthy pattern that are different in Latin America, Africa, Europe, Asia, etc. This is the kind of mask we are using and hygiene measures. But at the end, we also need to have planetary nutrition. That means that also COVID needs to be treated with vaccines and uh, measures that overcome the individual and the specific population. Therefore, uh, when people ask about precision nutrition, we need to say that it's an important endeavor to assure personalized population and planetary nutrition, and that we just need to interpret and to move forward in action concerning planet well-being. Thank you. Thank you, Alfredo. And at this point, uh, Francis is going to join us uh, a little bit uh, uh, in a couple of minutes, maybe, or even he has already joined. But before that, I will use the time to ask one question to uh, Sam Godfrey. A wonderful talk, Sam, on the food safety and uh, in terms of the uh, measures that are taken either by the global agencies or by the local agencies. And normally we hear of a food uh, safety breakout and then we look into traceability and find out where is the source and then we are done with it. But how is the pub, how, how public are going to be empowered by knowing these were the preventive steps taken and therefore quantifiably the industries involved, the supply chain involved has prevented this food safety breakout because of this prevented preventable step that we have taken. So do you have any comment on that, uh, Sam Godfrey? Because it's a little bit longish question, but uh, you may have a precise answer. Thank you. Sam? I wonder if in the audience is Frank Sterling that can help us with this discussion. Uh, Frank, I think Samuel is not, is not present anymore. Right, right. OK, thank you. Uh, I'm here, yes. Oh, Sam is here? Okay. No, that's Frank, Frank speaking. No, Samuel is not with us anymore. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, we are coming to the end and uh, we also would uh, like to request Frank. Uh, Francis has joined now. Yes, Francis is here. Okay, wonderful. And please accept my apologies in our part of the world. I don't want to go on and on and on. What it matters most the internet systems disappoint you. But um, I, I really want to say uh, a statement that without safe food to eat, as the food technologists say, there is no food security. Uh, so it's very important that our food safety is looked at. And uh, that, is, that is a key thing. To do this, our policymakers must issue regulating dynamics that would help the populace. Without the policymakers getting involved in all of this, they cannot be aloof. They've got to be involved in issuing regulations tough on, uh, uh, we talked about, we talked about a lot about the food industry, but it is important that we use all available techniques and I'm glad that uh, 
uh, Alfredo talked about the use of the onyx application in precision nutrition to fight obesity uh, dynamics. Now, Victor, I'm sure, would have mentioned about the food systems uh, in diet quality. So, applying all the technologies in addressing collectively to address our challenge is very key. And particularly for me, coming from, uh, from Africa, we do need these technologies. We do need all hands on deck, particularly between the agriculturists, the food technologies, and the nutritionists working collaboratively to find solutions. Because come 2030, we might not be able to address uh, the challenges that have been put forward to us. And so I think that this is uh, a very important thing to take. And the pandemics, as we have seen, we, we particularly in Africa, we face a lot of challenges. That, for the grace of God, uh, would have died like Christ. And, and, and I keep on saying that we have a lot of foods. Africa is rich of resources. Have we explored this collectively and find solutions to address the problem that we have? Thank you, Bakas and Alfredo. Excellent job. You guys Thank you, Francis. Uh, wonderful comment. And uh, those are distilled wisdom. Uh, it's wonderful. We welcome you. Thank you. Uh, uh, we are coming to close of the discussion, Alfredo. We are on time. And uh, yes, can we, we close the discussion? Yes, uh, we have time. And I would like that uh, one of the uh, um, person that are attending the meeting at this moment, I will ask, ask if uh, Dr. Wallace can give more information about food safety issues with an international point of view. To extend the presentation she did, I wonder if uh, she can extend now uh, Professor Wallace, um, her presentation. Okay. Um, yes, I, I think maybe if I just pick up on that last question um, that, that Prakash was asking about outbreaks, because I, I think there's a, there's a nice kind of overlap here um, between what, what I've been um, talking about earlier uh, and some of these other issues. Um, because I think one of the one of the issues that we need to learn from outbreaks, um, we need to learn the lessons, and we need to pass those lessons on to the people that that um, are working in the supply chain and who can make a difference. Um, one of, one of the things that um, I've seen over the years, and we've written several editions of books, as as you know, um, but what we've tried to look at is some of these figures and some and the outbreaks that are happening and, and what we can learn from them and, and something that strikes me is that there's quite often repetition um, we see the same problems in different businesses sometimes we see the same problems in the same businesses um, sometimes um, spread out across the years but I think the message for me is that we need to learn from outbreaks and to be able to do that, I think we need good outbreak investigation, first of all, uh, by, the, by the authorities. And we need that to be published and to be accessible um, to people who can then learn fro from it. Um, we've been doing a little bit of work around um, causes of um, outbreaks and incidents and trying to get back to the root causes. Um, so we've got a paper on that and we're, we're at the moment we're trying to do some work around cultural causes. So the, the, the food safety culture piece that's behind uh, outbreaks as well. Um, and, I, and I think it's by un understanding these kind of things and what has caused things to go wrong that helps us to um, build stronger systems and make sure that it, it, uh, it goes right. Um, so I hope that that helps to kind of give a perspective on, on that, that question. Yeah, um, thanks. And uh, yeah, very happy to see collaboration going forward between the groups um, for us to, to look at things like food safety culture. With that wonderful uh, summary that you gave, Carolyn, quantifiables of a food outbreak, which makes the public very confident of the systems on food safety. Uh, otherwise, we only hear the wrong news of food safety breakouts, and I think how much are prevented is not known that way, yeah. so public would be. Thank you very much for backing up that question and answering it very well. With that, I think we are coming close to the time on the dot now, and um, Alfredo, uh, yes, I think we should close this session.
and yes. uh, allow it to break out and then yes. reassemble for the global discussion where we have with us a guest uh, uh, with us, Frank uh, Sperling, who will join us and will take a global agenda. And uh, that this is where we can now uh, request ISC for a, a very quick break, bio break maybe, and we'll reassemble in five minutes. Is that okay, Alfredo? Is that yes, that's okay? Thank you very okay. much. Great, we'll thank you.
Welcome back to all of you on the global discussion that uh, we will have now. I would uh, request uh, both myself and uh, Alfredo would request uh, Frank Sperling to join us as guest. Frank? Yeah, I'm here. I'm just oh, wonderful. Uh, visible, it seems. <laughs> wonderful. Okay, there we are. There you go. Thank, uh, welcome, Frank. <laughs> and uh, for uh, everybody's information, Frank is the lead author of the ISAC ISA report on resilient food systems. And uh, he has been an exponent on this and his active participation in the UNFSS has uh, clearly shown the leadership that he has given to ISC and the fraternity of food scientists, technologies and nutritionists on the sustainability agenda on the food and also with the environment. So I think uh, to begin with, uh, perhaps I will uh, start the discussion, Frank, with this uh, a very generic question that uh, how, what do you see on the international scientific community uh, that we can all strengthen its voice at the intergovernmental level, particularly with FAO, uh, UNEP, and also the World Food Program with a focus on food science, technology, and nutrition. Frank, please. Okay, um, I'll try to have some interesting perspectives on this. Um, I think overall, uh, we first have to acknowledge that intergovernmental processes have been quite successful in highlighting sustainability challenges. So if we look at the IPCC or IPBES on, on bringing uh, climate change um, and uh, biodiversity to the forefront of the international agenda. Now, the interesting thing is, and I think it was also a real um, um, shown again by the pandemic, is the the multi multitude of problems that we are facing. I think it was said earlier in the session, you know, with the, the you know, the, the complexity of challenges that is increasing. And um, and while at the same time, often uh, we, we we point to uh, these problems in a, in a, in a fragmented way. And um, the food system in, in many ways can act as a bridge builder across the conventions. I mean, it is part of the problem, but also part of the solution of global environmental change. And um, so if we um, think about, uh, um, in particular, that we see now um, in, in the recent climate conference, COP26, but the Yen Food System Summit and the CBD coming up, there's increasing emphasis on nature-based solutions that address multiple problems. So development problems, food security, nutritional security, uh, climate change, biodiversity conservation, so bringing this together is, is I think, an, a profound opportunity. And there, I think, international uh, scientific communities play a critical role in linking to organizations such as FAO and UNEP and World Food Program that recognize these interlinkages and being cognizant on the one hand side on the global sustainability challenges, but at the same time helping to connect it to contextualize solutions. And I think in many ways, you've been discussing this in the last two days, uh, how you uh, can use innovation and technology and in different in development contexts and how we can then um, uh, address the, the broader sustainability transformations that are required of food systems. So I, I see this opportunity of movement now of integrating across the conventions. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, for that uh, excellent way of uh, putting the things in the right perspective. Uh, any of any of the participants would like to have any suggestions on this question uh, before we move forward in terms of uh, what any any game changing plan that you think that uh, we need to really look at the intergovernmental level particularly at the global organizations on the on the international scientific community how we can address this point if there anybody in the participants who want to give an input they're welcome at this point as we go forward. If there are uh, no suggestion, uh, I would uh, go forward to requesting Alfredo to yes. ask uh, any question. While the audience uh, raise any questions, um, I would like Sorry, just to... I can to... hardly hear you. Um, can, you hear me can I add one more point maybe before we move on? Please, um, please, please. I, I think the other important aspect of, um, you know, if we look at intergovernmental le level, we've been very successful in problem identification, but now it's moving towards solutions. And I think the challenge in many ways, also in terms of 
is the communication of, of these solutions. You know, what does a sustainable food system look like and how can scientific, international scientific bodies help communicate also the narratives, not just within inter, at the intergovernmental level, but also in the wider public. So the, 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 the framing, the narratives of and the, the vision of what uh, sustainable food systems look like based um, and informed by science. Uh, uh, Frank, uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but I would like to, to know if you can envisage, can you give us a view of the innovation that can be expected in sustainability? Well, that's, um, that's extremely, ex extremely uh, broad, but I, I, um, I think uh, is especially, I mean, what we highlighted, we, we had this YASA IEC consultative process, you know, like uh, what were the vulnerabilities revealed uh, in food systems during the pandemic and, you know, how, what does that mean for the recovery? And, and uh, it was one that was very clear. First of all, we need to ensure uh, that um, innovation there is, remains an emphasis, not just in developed countries, but particularly in developing countries, so that we don't have a widening gap of capacity, but um, we, we make sure that there's a drive forwards uh, holistically towards sustainable food system transformations. And um, I mean, I guess you, you discussed a lot of um, technological solutions and innovations already in, in your sessions. Um, uh, and. I mean, there's, there's the, advan uh, the advances in biotechnology, um, um, gene editing, and so on, uh, uh, fast-tracking uh, trade selection, and, and these are great opportunities, novel foods that, um, for example, um, also um, with, uh, you know, um, using, for example, um, marine plant-based foods, algae, to, to uh, possibly alleviate uh, pressure on terrestrial resources. But I think it's the, the there is no one innovation or technology that I put forward. It's the mix. It's it's the advancing high tech uh, solutions, but also looking at what are the underutilized solutions that are already there. How can we innovate processes to make them more accessible? How do we diversify food system? The increasing. Uh, I mean, we're using largely to sixty six percent nine crops, as I understand. Uh, from our dialogues, and, and there's thousands of crops that could be used. There's the, um, you know, the so how do we use of this? How do we diversify food system and contextualize them more in light of the challenges, the current and future risks they're facing? Thank you, thank you, Frank. Continuing the same question which uh, Alfredo asked about sustainable innovations leading to a greater penetration of science. Perhaps I would uh, first request Honda Shen to, can you look at this question from the perspective of nanoscience revolutionizing uh, game changing in this aspect? Then I will go to Feridun on the same question, Dr. Sh uh, Feridun Shahidi. First, uh, Honda Chen on this question, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prakash. I think that, uh, uh, well, I want to very quickly say that uh, nanoscale science uh, is about a science at the intermediate length scale. And this is between atomic uh, and uh, a micro uh, space. And the, uh, the material in this space that it can be imagined, it can be manipulated, can create it, it can be studied with the uh, uh, with undiscovered uh, uh, unique properties so that we can take advantage of that uh, to serve various uh, different uh, scientific exploration and then can lead to the solution addressed uh, uh, food safety, food security, and uh, nutritional security. This is from uh, enhanced production, uh, effective delivery of agrochemicals, and then protect the environment. Uh, improving the, the nutrient quality, uh, enhance the safety through the intervention and detection, and uh, all the way through the understanding the fate and the transformation across the length of scale of a food as affected by the structure in the human GI system related to the bioavailability. And so there's a tremendous potential in a nanoscale science. It's just fundamental science that can help and contribute as a part of a two sets uh, for us to explore that space. So I'm very optimistic. Thank you. 
Thank you, Hong Continuing Alfredo's question, uh, Feridun Shahidi, uh, that is a wonderful question from the nutrition aspect uh, with your large experience of nutraceuticals and also bioactives. Where, where are we today in terms of the planetary health uh, with regard to the sustainable innovations in those areas and understanding at the bottom of the uh, pyramid in terms of molecular interactions? Feridun Jahidi, please. Yes, uh, thank, thank you very much, Prakash. Uh, Prakash, uh, but perhaps we can invite Feridun Jahidi in order to give us a view and, of course, the previous chairman, Ping Fan Chao, to extend these views. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, first, of, first of all, I'd like to thank having the opportunity to see all groups coming together. We've been talking and talking, now we have started walking. So it is very important to see this development. With respect to nanoscience and nanotechnology, of course, this is a very nice, at least for the delivery point of view of the uh, functionality of the products. And in terms of the uh, health effects that they may impart uh, to the uh, individuals that are consumers, what was used to be very healthy, maybe with the particle size reduction, it would become toxic or what was not toxic, uh, we may use at a very smaller level to basically deliver them and have that system to be site specific to make use of it in the way we want. So uh, I think it is very important opportunity now to see the nutritionists and food scientists together working and, and um, making this happen in a way that is sustainable. And obviously the safety aspects is very important. And uh, obviously without safety, there is no sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Feridun. Is uh, Ping Fang Rao still there? Because it must be past uh, two o'clock in China. So, Ping Fang, in case Ping Fang is not there, perhaps I would uh, use this opportunity to ask Frank, uh, wh wh where do you see the impact of pandemic, Frank, in terms of food security and uh, also the sustainable resilience, if I may use that word, in mm -hmm. the food systems? Yeah, Frank. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um there were widespread uh, and uh, diverse impacts on the demand and supply side, and we outlined some of, uh, outlined some of them in our report, and, uh, and it's still evolving. But I, what I find particularly striking is that uh, the pandemic illustrated how quickly uh, long-term development gains that have been made with regards to poverty alleviation and then um, food security can un unravel, right? Uh, I mean, we have now 118 more million more people um, uh, going hungry in 2020 than in uh, 2019, uh, as I recall correct, if I recall correctly on the latest um, reports from the FAO. And uh, now uh, at the same time, uh, the, the, um, the, the spillover of uh, zoonotic diseases um, as, uh, as illustrated by COVID-19 also shows the entanglement between human and natural systems and if we take this together, then we need to think about um, how do we place a greater emphasis on resilience building in, in food systems? You know, how do we um, in, uh, ensure that uh, development gains made are more secured? Um, ex uh, you know, the need to the opportunity and the recovery to expand and uh, lessons learned from exp expanding safety nets and so on. But at the same time, that has to happen while we transform food systems. So there's a tension, right? In some ways, how do we maintain and secure functionality of a system while transforming it at the same time? And, and so we have to think about resilience in a very dynamic context. And the resilience has to be brought, uh, brought in focus. It has to be focused on multiple hazards. It has to focus on social, economic, and environmental resilience. And there's an inherently... Um, tensions that uh, need to be resolved. We cannot just emphasize resilience and forget about the transformation because then there's the risk of lock-in of structures that might become unsustainable and vulnerable in the long run. So it's, 
it's really, um, and at YASA, uh, we want to build further on this, is like, how do we uh, balance basically the demand for resilience building with the demand for transformation? And I think uh, the uh, pandemic um, has under underlined the urgency of, of, of doing so, and, and given that we are facing much more complex challenges with climate change and so on. I can further elaborate on some impacts, but that's my first take. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank I you. wonder if uh, Professor Pim Van Rao, who was the chair of the fifth session, could give us an overview of the session five, but also session six. Pim Van Rao, as chairman, could just give us an overview of the previous sessions. Alfredo, perhaps uh, it, I don't know whether he's there, but it's past uh, two o'clock in China, in China, in the midnight. Okay. So, so maybe I don't know. Ping Fang is there. Uh, he will respond. In the meantime, we can uh, go forward uh, with uh, a, a, a very important question, uh, Frank. For you know, we, we talk about uh, uh, energy uh, new, neutrality and energy new, carbon neutral and so on. But when it really comes to food processing and uh, we don't calculate the carbon footprint from the plant all the way to the consumer, we only take mm -hmm. a small, small portion of it and say it's carbon neutral. So when we look at uh, the uh, production productivity in the field all the way down to consumer, uh, and the placement in the market segment for over two, three months, it is staying there consuming energy. So how do, how do we really look all this from the point of scientific unions and the academies who can, who can really deliver a large amount of this information and share that knowledge with the, with the challenges that we are going to have in the 21st century? Uh, what, what's, what's your thinking? What's your take on it, Frank? Um, I, I, it's a better place than me uh, 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 with the, these units to, uh, to, uh, to answer that, those questions. But I, um, I, I feel the important thing is to, uh, when we look in the transformation of food systems and also in how we place innovation to address one problem at a bigger uh, uh, you know, component of the food system that we also look across, the, uh, you know, what does that mean for the impact pathways across the food, food system? So that really taking this holistic uh, perspective on, on food systems, then um, then um, I guess I highlighted earlier the, the importance now using food systems also to address multiple development environmental and uh, challenges together. And, uh, you know, like the critical, pivotal, the transformation for reaching the SDGs. And, and strengthening uh, north-south partnerships and south-south partnerships, but also thinking maybe more creatively how um, the scientific community, by stepping out uh, of the ivory tower in, in the context of these applied problems, how do we can engage st stakeholders in terms of co-creating narratives for food system transformation, creating understanding for food system transformation, um, making sure that we target the right stakeholders. For example, when there needs to be much greater attention also be paid to uh, the role uh, of smallholders. How do we um, link to the private sector? Um, um, I mean, how far, and, and that's challenging that, again, that balance, um, uh, for, you know, being uh, robust on the science, but at the same time, making sure that science actually uh, connects more with the applied uh, questions. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I wonder if any attendant in the audience could have any question for the panelists or either just to make a kind of um, value of the sessions right. in relation with uh, the planet health. Uh, I wonder if there are any in the audience that can contribute with some additional ideas. Alfredo, the, I see Jeffrey Campbell, who is the former president of IUFOS. He's there. Perhaps his views are very important, as you mentioned uh, uh, on the sessions, both the yesterday and today, but to take home some lessons. Jeffrey, if it is okay for you to, to comment on that, uh, we would appreciate it, as Alfredo said. 
So, uh, Prakash and colleagues, everyone, I think it's been very important to uh, combine food science and nutrition and come together. I think that's the most important thing. Interesting that I know um, Anilati, for example, comes from a department which I used to be in in Ghana called Department of Nutrition and Food Science. You may say well ahead of its time. And although um, both subjects have so much to offer, we can learn so much from each other that I think these sort of exercises internationally, sharing knowledge, hearing about traditional foods, for instance, from Charles of War in Africa, very, very important. And other parts of the world will have their own traditional foods, some of which will have shared their knowledge. But this important thing here is that you've brought together food science and nutrition. And I think it should be uh, one of many, as um, Gordon McBean also suggested. This is just a vital thing to do and something that should become the norm for the future. So well done and uh, keep up the good work. And uh, you're overcoming problems of pandemic and getting together, uh, coming together all around the world. So well done to you all and please keep going. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Wonderful. Very, very distilled wisdom and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, since there are not uh, many hands going up, but uh, I have an have a, a important question that perhaps, uh, uh, Frank, you can, you can look at it. We talk about uh, sustainability. We talk about innovation, sustainability, even climate change, sustainability, but very seldom we look at the reverse engineering and look at the sustainability of uh, small and micro scale food processing, which have taken up a, a very big lead in the pandemic because the uh, food import export restrictions, etc., really created a, a barrier. And so they, they were innovating in rediscovering, reinventing traditional foods and processing at a, at a safe level with a regulatory compliance. And survived through the whole 18 months of the pandemic and still going on. So this, this is, is very, very important in the sustainability angle, which Sheikh mentioned, and also our nutrition friends also mentioned it very clearly, especially Jacqueline, you know, who, who really made the, uh, the difference on the Mediterranean diet. So rediscovering the small scale units of food engineering, which are sustainable, is so important for the future, not the mega scale working, even though it is important, uh, which will have a carbon neutrality towards negative. So therefore, where do you put this perspectively? What has happened in 18 months saved thousands, millions of life. And uh, how do we take this as a model for futures disaster management? Frank. Well, I think this is an interesting one. I mean, there's is clearly capturing these innovations that happened during the pandemic is, is very, very important and, and see um, how they can add to the robustness and resilience of this system overall. Um, what we, in the Yasa IC consultation, what we talked about is, you know, where do you need to build diversity or redundancy into the system, right? In, in, in the context of the pandemic, it's great that um, there's this diversity of local production, but, um, and, and, but then if you go, you know, it's, it's more localized food systems and, and so on. This is great. But then if you have um, uh, climatic change and climatic extremes, then it might be important to have trade to, to buffer against uh, loss of agriculture productivity. So there, there's these, these, this, this uh, again, uh, looking at how do we build um, resilience into a system that has to manage local to global shocks and of, of very different natures so that we don't just prepare the system for one shock and then we get surprised by another. But uh, think really where is more flexibility, redundancy and diversity needed maybe in, in this very fluid environment and interconnected environment we're in. And I think uh, micro scale solutions definitely have a very important place. Also urban urban gardening, uh, you know, like urban agriculture systems, um, vertical agriculture, all these new opportunities that are arising um, uh, and innovations and in, in how to do and how to produce uh, food and how to connect uh, uh, producers and consumers. And I think the pandemic offers some very valuable lessons there because it fast-tracked a lot of innovation. 
Thank you. Thank you. That's, a, that's a wonderful. Uh, uh, and there is some uh, backlash on the, on the sound. Uh, somebody has put on the mic. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, we, we also have Don Mercer here, uh, who has been a great communicator and uh, who has always said, we may publish papers in Lancet, in BMJ, in the most prestigious journal, but how do you communicate that to the common man is very, very important. So can I request Don Mercer to comment on that? And uh, because he's a voracious communicator, I would say. Don, it's a great uh, pleasure to welcome you and uh, hear about how do we communicate a fantastic paper published with an impact factor so high to a common man? And what's the trick involved in that? Do all of us have to commit on that and communicate? And Don, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, you've kind of put me on the spot here. Um, <laughs> please forgive my COVID hairdo. Um, but I, I think really what we're needing to do is to put things into what I call plain language or, or lay language. And we have to stop talking like scientists and start talking as if we were discussing things over a cup of coffee with people. But that doesn't mean that we stop the scientific stuff. No, 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 that's super important. It's really where the action is and, and we never want to do anything to jeopardize that. But there are so many, um, what I would call small scale processors and entrepreneurs out there who don't have a good solid background in food science or any kind of science and for them to take the information that is found in the referee journals and the scientific literature is essentially a major undertaking and they just don't have the tools to do that job. So we, we need to basically then have, um, I guess we would say, uh, outlets for information that um, would, would be in um, traditional language. And um, I, I often think that IFOST could have um, a part of the website or whatever where we could have scientists who actually do a synopsis of the information and say, you know, basically here is what you should be doing and, and put that into, into everyday language. So uh, I, I think that's basically it in a, in a nutshell, Prakash, and, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Thanks, Don. I think that is a message uh, Alfred or both of us can give to the food scientist community and the nutrition community that we may publish in anywhere, but uh, I think it should be a moral obligation to look at uh, communicating a paragraph of whatever we have done to the common public in any forum, uh, either through a blog or through any method, that would really make the common man or the common person in the, in the audience who may not be a scientist of that level, but he may be a great engineer and he would understand it better. Or he may be an ordinary person who would read a newspaper and see what is happening. I think it's a great message and we should really uh, communicate and I request all the people who have joined here to, to look at that kind of possibility of every paper that you publish, if you can make a small blog out of it and with an understanding that the common man can understand that. Thank you. Here is one question. Yes, Don. Uh, I just want to point out something as an example. Yeah. In doing a workshop, um, I did a little demonstration where I took some sliced carrots and put the slices of carrots in a saucer and poured some hydrogen peroxide on them. And of course the peroxidase enzyme started the little bubbles forming and everything like that. And then took another three or four slices of um, carrots, put them in a coffee mug, poured boiling water on them, let them sit there for a little while, um, cooled them down, dried them off, put them in a saucer, poured peroxide on them, and there were no bubbles. So that shows to the folks who were there why they need to blanch their products because we're using the peroxidase as an indicator enzyme for the more uh, deleterious yeah. degradative enzymes 
And someone came to me and said, you know, I never knew why we had to um, blanch, but now I understand it and they can see the bubbles. So, Thank you. Um, you know, that's kind of where I'm netting. Wonderful, okay. wonderful. Uh, Alfredo, there is a question from Annie Pereira. Would you like to read from the chat? Yes, uh, I think we are just running up, but in any case, I would like to mention that this endeavor as it has been very successful and hopefully will be fruitful. I think this is a one way to collaborate IUFOS and INS, perhaps with a communication of uh, in the journal that IUFOS has on operation, but also in the congresses that every four years IUFOS and INS uh, have. I, I think that perhaps, and given the opportunity that ISC International Scientific uh, Council give us, uh, is just to promote this activity in a yearly activity uh, for collaboration between IOFOS, INS, and perhaps other unions. Therefore, I think we are just finishing, but giving thanks to the organizer and particularly to ISC that allow us to create this uh, collaboration and also uh, to have in, uh, guests from really all continents, from America, Latin America, Europe, Africa, Asia, and uh, eventually uh, Japan, in the, just in the other corner. Uh, thank you very much, and I don't know okay. if Prakas and yeah. you know, no, no. want to... Right, um, there is one more. A very short final remark. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Uh, I think there's a suggestion by Annie Pereira uh, from New Zealand, that garden to table starting in primary school, and uh, working our way through kids in their families and the next generation on nutrition revolution that we want to bring up is a wonderful way to look at it. Thanks, uh, Annie, for the suggestion. Uh, but I also want to Frank to give us a, a, a departing message from him in terms of what will be the one thing that we need to do in future for the academies, for the international scientific community, just one thing that we should not forget. That that will be a good take-home message, Frank. <laughs> well, you put me on the spot here. Yeah. Um, I, I think the one message is let's not waste this opportunity to restructure food systems in the recovery from this crisis, making them uh, more resilient but also more sustainable. There's a tremendous urgency to do so, and this is our chance to do it. Thank you. Uh, we're running short of time. We are almost about to close, but it's a great opportunity to have Frank with us. Thank you, Frank, for joining us in spite of your busy schedule. So nice Thank of you. And all the participants for listening. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are you first and are you NS? Uh, been great family friends for almost several decades, several decades, not today. So I think we have what this synergy of energy that has come forward in the knowledge meeting, knowledge program that ISC coordinated and planned in their platform has paved a way for us to go forward in the right direction with a clear constructive mechanism where we can really share and care. And I think it's very important. Alfredo mentioned about the Congresses. Yes, the ICN Congress is in December 2022, and the IU, IU First Congress is in Singapore in November 2022. So uh, even there, we see a total collaboration uh, for each other's working, but all, I request all the nutritionists and food scientists to attend both of them and make sure that you are available in large numbers to make sure that these are very, very important in terms of collaborative program, but not only collaborative programs, but also produce at a local level, the affordable, adaptable, and also the food that is assimilable. And that way we increase the agenda of nutrition. We also increase the number of jobs in the local area. And so those local solutions are our global problems, which will be not be there if we are able to solve at local level. So these local solutions for global problems is a way forward with the nutritionists, with the food scientists, the food technologists, and the engineers together. 
And I think ISC has created a wonderful knowledge partnership, which I'm sure more unions will join as time progresses. And I think this is a great way to move forward. And with that uh, closing statement from my side, I thank uh, Alison, I thank uh, Annie, I thank uh, Judith from IUFOS, I thank Tracy from IUNS, and of course, very close to me, Alfredo, uh, who has been always on the board to organize this. Thank you, Alfredo, for uh, sparing all that energy with us in, in the last two days and also preparation for that. And I thank all the chairs, I thank all the speakers, both from IUFOS and IUNS, and also our discussants, we and Souk and Francis today, and also Frank. So all this makes us a, a very nostalgic uh, experience, which will remain with us as an internal declaration that we all can take, that we don't want anybody to be dying of hunger in this world, in terms of so much prosperity we have, so much of food availability. So I think the world has to be ready for feeding 25 billion meals a day by 2030. That's the target that we all have to do per day, 25 billion meals a day. That requires engineering, that requires science, that requires technology, and that requires passion for science and compassion for people. And I think that's the, that's the way I would like to close this uh, session. Uh, any final words from Alfredo? If not, he already yeah. said, so we should really uh, wind yeah. up. We are getting late. Thank you. And it was an enjoyable uh, learning experience for me. Oh, yes. Thank, thank you. you very much. I just confirm all your statements mm -hmm. by giving thanks and also to invite you all to the Congress to be held in Japan and Singapore. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. All the best.